Hello, my name is Flora Hello. Huang, and I'm Hi, from Canada, 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 Canada,
Lane recognizes the substantial traditions and innovations in medical practice that have existed in native communities across the Americas, including indigenous technologies for pain management, reproductive health, and other forms of care, as well as the ongoing role of the Stanford American Indigenous Medical Students Organization here at Stanford Medicine. It's uh, telling that we're talking about, about the land and, and um, it, it does relate to um, our conference today. So I really wanted to thank Sam for organizing this and extend a warm welcome to our attendees and speakers. Uh, this is the fifth year that Lane has held a WIDS event, and it's been a pleasure to watch the event grow and thrive uh, throughout the world and at Lane. What started in this library as an in-person seminar with 25 people has grown to a virtual event with nearly 300 people registered today from around the world. The theme of today's conference, Connecting Health and the Environment Through Data, couldn't be more timely. Last summer, the United Nations General Assembly declared that everyone on the planet has a right to a healthy environment. And this was in recognition of what's considered the alarming decline of the natural world. We have all witnessed extreme temperatures and weather conditions, as well as the environmental pollutants in our air and water affect the health and well-being of the world's population. The UN resolution stated that climate change and environmental degradation were some of the most pressing threats to humanity's future and called upon nations to make efforts to ensure their populations have access to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment. This idea of making healthy environment a human right allows people to challenge environmentally destructive policies under human rights legislation. And this really can't come soon enough. A 2016 study estimated that every year more than 12 million people around the world die because they live or work in unhealthy environments. Respiratory diseases, many types of cancer and heart disease are just a few of the health concerns associated with environmental pollutants. People of low incomes are more likely to live in pollutant areas and have unsafe drinking water, and children and women are especially vulnerable. Last month, there was a renewed attention paid uh, to the long-standing problem of access to clean water. Across the globe, women are responsible for water collection in eight out of 10 households where there is no water on the premises. And it's estimated that they spend 200 million hours every day globally collecting water. This lack of easily accessible clean water makes women vulnerable to abuse, attack, ill health, and affects their productivity and their very ability to study work and fulfill their own personal and professional goals. I am so grateful that we have data scientists working on these issues. Data can help hold governments accountable. Tracking environmental pollutants and climate degradation and making sense of data is key to developing new laws and policies. And today we're going to hear some, from some amazing women about their research. Research has the potential to alter the health of populations around the world for the better, by providing data that can combat environmental health issues and environmental injustices. I'm really looking forward to learning from today's speakers and I'm gonna turn it back over to Sam to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so before I hand over the microphone to our keynote speaker, I will just cover a few housekeeping items. Um, so for the attendees, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to ask questions throughout the conference. If you see a question in the Q&A box that you would like to have answered, please use the like button next to the question to upvote it. During our Q&A sessions, we will ask questions to our speakers based on the question ranking in the Q&A box. So please feel free to interact with that. Um, live captioning is available for the duration of the conference. Uh, click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen to view the captions. And lastly, I'd like to cover the agenda for the conference. So we're beginning with our keynote speaker. And after her talk, we will have a 10 minute break. When we return from the break, we will hear seven amazing lightning talks from our Connecting Health and the Environment Through Data panelists. Immediately following the series of lightning talks, I will be moderating a Q&A session with the panelists using the audience questions provided in the Q&A box. After the Q&A session, we're going to break for five minutes and we will wrap up the conference with a closing keynote address. Um, after the closing keynote, there will be another brief Q&A session. And just a reminder, the conference is being recorded. So if you need to step away at any time today, you'll receive the recording email once the event concludes. 
So thank you. Those were all the housekeeping items. And with that, I am very honored to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Lisa Federer. Dr. Federer is the acting director of the National Library of Medicine's Office of Strategic Initiatives, serving as principal advisor to the NLM director on strategic directions of NLM, including open science, analysis, evaluation, and reporting on NLM programs and activities. She holds a PhD in information studies from the University of Maryland and an MLIS from the University of California, Los Angeles, as well as graduate certificates in data science and data visualization. She's here today to give us a keynote address titled The Accidental Data Librarian, A Journey to Data Science. Thank you, Dr. Federer, and please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, it is a privilege to get to be here with all of you today. Let me just bring my slides up here. All right, so um, as Sam said, the title of my talk today is The Accidental Data Librarian, A Journey to Data Science. And this is a different kind of talk than the talks that I normally give. Um, and I, I really wanna focus today on how I got to the point that I am, which is kind of an unusual journey, um, and hopefully inspire all of you to find your own path to uh, the, the outcome that you're looking for. So I want to talk a little bit about my winding path to data science. Um, and as I said, uh, give you some thoughts about finding your own path, and then touch a little bit on directions and opportunities in data science. And I will try to leave some time at the end for questions. So as uh, Sam said, you can put those in the Q&A box. So once upon a time, I uh, was an English professor, an adjunct instructor of English. I uh, got my bachelor's degree in English and then went on to get a master's in English with a specialty in creative writing, dreaming that I would one day be the next great American novelist. Um, but fairly soon after that, realizing that that was probably not as realistic as I might hope, um, I did a Bachelor of French and studied abroad in Normandy in France, um, thinking maybe I would like to live in France and teach English there. Um, and while I loved my time there and I absolutely adore France, I knew that it wasn't really the right path for me. So I started teaching. Um, I was an adjunct instructor at the University of North Texas, as well as North Lake Community College. And I supplemented that with um, being an evening and weekend manager at the Crate and Barrel. Um, and never imagined at this time that I would one day be working at the National Library of Medicine. In fact, I had never even heard of it. <laughs> and now I have uh, pursued a PhD in information science from the University of Maryland, as well as my MLIS from UCLA. And I have been at NIH for uh, almost 10 years now, first starting at the NIH library as their research data informationist and launching their data services program, and then moving over to the National Library of Medicine as their data science and open science librarian. And then um, as of about six months ago, moving into the position of the acting director of the Office of Strategic Initiatives. So I want to talk a little bit about what it is that I do um, and then dive a little bit more into how I got here. So I am the acting director of our Office of Strategic Initiatives, as I said, which is charged with really tracking everything that NLM is doing um, around our strategic plan, as well as are we accomplishing our mission. Our strategic plan has three primary pillars, um, the first of which is to innovate, build, and sustain an open digital ecosystem for health information, science, and scholarship. Second, to optimize user experience with and use of NLM digital resources. And then third, to assure a data-savvy biomedical workforce and a data-ready public. So as you can see, there's quite a lot here related to data science and open science. Um, it is very much our mission to make information and data available to people. And uh, so, you know, data science is very much at the core of what we do. I think data science as a phrase appears in our strategic plan something like 70 times. So very central um, to the mission of the library. Within the Office of Strategic Initiatives, as I said, we work on strategic planning and implementation of the strategic plan. We also do um, analysis of our activities and formal reporting to Congress and other governmental bodies who ask for information. Um, and we're really working on 
evaluation as a way of developing an evidence base for evidence-based decision-making. And because of the fact that, again, data science is so central to our strategic plan, we do um, focus on data science and open science activities um, within the office and uh, also have a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of the work that we do. I'm also involved at the larger NIH level with their strategic plan for data science, which has five overarching areas, which I will not read through entirely. Um, but the area that I have been working with most has been uh, data science workforce development. So uh, making sure that we have a data, a data workforce or a biomedical workforce that is prepared to take on the challenges of and uh, realize the opportunities of data science within this biomedical space. So how did I get here? How did I go from being um, an adjunct English professor to being at the National Library of Medicine? In part, it was a lot of failure and rejection. Uh, I recognize that I've had a lot of privilege in my life, but I have also had to have a lot of tenacity to get to the point where I am. And I think a lot of serendipity as well. Um, I after I realized that uh, I was not going to be a novelist and I wasn't going to go teach English in France, I did spend about eight years as an adjunct instructor, and it was not the kind of thing that I knew that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. For one thing, it was not... Um, economically sustainable, um, but it was also not the challenge that I felt like I needed. So I applied to English PhD programs thinking that I would go on to get my PhD and do research and, um, you know, be in academia. And I was rejected from PhD programs I don't even remember how many times now. Um, and so it kind of got to the point where I was like, this isn't happening. I need to think about what I'm going to do instead. Um, so in my late 20s, I sort of started to think about what do I want to be when I grow up? And a path that sort of presented itself to me was uh, librarianship. My grandmother had been a librarian and I uh, was very interested in archives at the time. So I thought, let's apply to library school and see what happens. I'm originally from the Los Angeles area, so I applied to UCLA and very happily I got in. And it was there that I took really two courses that um, put me on the path that I have been walking since then. Um, one of them is unfortunately a class that I do not remember the name of, um, and I was looking to find it, but it was too long ago. They don't have that stuff available online anymore, but it was with Dr. Christine Borgman, who is um, very well known in the field, and it really opened my eyes to the fact that um, data is super interesting and that there's really a lot of connections between the things that we do as librarians and the knowledge and background that we have and how that can relate to data. The other course was a course in medical knowledge representation, which was actually offered through the uh, biomedical engineering department at UCLA. And we spent an entire semester looking at how do we represent knowledge and information about, in this case, one particular disease, which was a uh, type of brain cancer known as glioblastoma multiforma. So it might seem like a simple question, um, like you have a medical record, but there's really quite a lot going on. Um, in the case of this particular condition, um, you have things like the, the clinical record, what the doctor uh, writes and what uh, like vital signs are recorded. You have imaging, you have of, um, drugs that have been given, potentially surgery. So there's a lot of different interventions that are going on, and we need to be able to track over time how these interventions affect um, the condition and how do we do that in a way that is easy for clinicians to interact with as well as for researchers. And getting to do this really deep dive into this type of data was fascinating, and it really gave me the sense that there's so much untapped knowledge here that we have huge amounts of data. And if only we could figure out how to work with this data and how to extract information from it, we could have cures for so many different things potentially that we don't know about right now. So it really got me interested in how can I be part of making this happen? How can I um, be part of 
this biomedical research ecosystem that takes advantage of data and uses it in the best way possible to get actionable knowledge from it. So after that, uh, I graduated and knew that I wanted to work in biomedical libraries. And I spent a couple years working at the UCLA Biomedical Library, where I got to further pursue my interest in data. Um, and I also, uh, I was basically a liaison librarian that also did data work. And I loved my job and I loved UCLA, but I saw a listing for a position at the NIH library to work as their research data informationist and start their data services program. And I was like, hey, let's let's see what happens. Let's apply for this. Um, and uh, shortly after that, I got the job, packed up and moved across the country to uh, the D.C. area where I currently live and where I knew no one at the time um, to take on this exciting new challenge. And it has been um, a wonderful challenge that I have gotten to undertake. During that time uh, that I have been at NIH, I also started to pursue a Ph.D. In doing um, my work, I realized that I really like research. So not only interacting with researchers on the work that they're doing with their data, but also getting my own data and doing research. I participated in a program called the Institute for Research Design and Librarianship, um, which was a really excellent opportunity to uh, sort of like a boot camp on doing research. And it further cemented my love of research and got me thinking, maybe this PhD thing is something that I'm going to do after all. Um, I also felt like it was really important um, for especially myself as a young-ish woman in a scientific uh, arena, to be able to kind of earn that scientific respect, to have a, to be Dr. Federer and not just Lisa the librarian. Um, and so I felt like it was important to go ahead and do that. And um, fortunately, I had the support of um, both of my directors at the various different libraries that I've worked at during that time um, and did go on and pursue my PhD. So that's a little bit about how I got to where I am at this point. And I want to talk now about finding your own path and give you some advice that hopefully you will find useful, um, both in terms of data science and career, but maybe even your personal life as well. So I think it's incredibly important in uh, the field of data science to really embrace lifelong learning, um, because this is a field where things are changing all the time. What is uh, current and the way of doing things today is probably not the way that we're going to be doing things in five, 10, maybe even two years. So it's really important to be uh, willing and interested to continue uh, your learning and to have that curiosity to continue um, exploring all of the things that are out there. And fortunately, there are a lot of ways to do this that don't require you to pay for a degree or um, a class lots of free um, opportunities to learn online through things like uh, MOOCs, massive open online courses, um, and even just self-study um, using resources that are available um, often freely online. I also think it's really important to think outside the box. So this is a story of failure and creative problem solving in tweets and code. Uh, so this first tweet uh, captures some of the, my experience with doing my PhD. Um, I'm defending my dissertation in 53 days, and right now a lot of it isn't working, and I'm filled with existential despair, but I know in the end I'll look back on this as a, a time that I stressed too much and ate a really unhealthy amount of Kraft mac and cheese, which was very, very unhealthy, the amount that I ate. Uh, one time my a friend of mine uh, emailed me a gift card for DoorDash, like, you have to eat something other than mac and cheese. Um, but uh, I would say part of that involves thinking about the possibilities and again, thinking outside the box about what kind of possibilities are available. Um, so I tweeted every time I like, I wonder if our stats can do this weird specific thing. Surely only I want it to do. The answer is invariably yes. Today's weird thing, write all error messages to a text file. So I love kind of thinking about, I wonder if R can do this, or I wonder if I can accomplish this, and going down that rabbit hole and exploring and finding out um, things that I wouldn't necessarily have expected. 
Um, I also think um, thinking outside the box also means taking advantage of the people around you and the network that you have. Um, so in this particular situation, um, despite many valiant efforts, I could not get the package working that I needed for uh, the research that I was going to be undertaking. And so I uh, went to Twitter, um, where I was very active previously, not so much lately, um, and just kind of put the question out to the, the Twitterverse. And Soon enough, um, in fact, I think it was like less than five minutes after I put this tweet out, um, a colleague had uh, given me the answer to my problem. Um, so I think it's really useful to take advantage of, again, your network and maybe even people that you don't know so well um, and make some connections to, uh, you know, further your, your efforts. I also think it's really important to get creative. Um, so here, yeah, this is a very unusual problem that I came across. I was doing in my dissertation research um, work with biomedical um, research data and the descriptions of those data sets. And I was doing a process called um, lemmatization where you basically chop off the end of words so that you um, collect words that are similar. So like live, living, lived. The problem was that it also would lemmatize the word liver um, to think it was part of the live um, set of words. So I was like, how do I get around this? Well, let's for now change all of the instances of liver in the data set to unicorn, and then it won't make that mistake. So I had a lot of weird figures um, that I initially came up with where it was like, um, you know, the most important word in this data set is unicorn, um, but actually it was liver. So I think um, there's a lot of ways that you can solve problems if you, again, think outside the box and get a little bit creative with it. Um, I spoke about using your network, but I also think it's really important to think um, intentionally about how you broaden that network, um, both in terms of the diversity of people that you're talking to in terms of subject matter, but also diversity in general, um, getting outside of your group and opening that up to people with different life experiences and different backgrounds. Data science is really inherently a team science. Um, as you can see here, there's a lot of different um, subject matter expertise and domain experience that goes into this, as well as computing, um, statistics. So it's really unusual to find a person who has all of this. Um, you would have to be in school for a very long time and study quite a lot. Um, and so typically data science doesn't happen with just one person sitting there doing stuff. Um, you have to bring together different people that have different expertise and think about how you can work together as a team. So I think it's really incredible to talk to people with different experiences and expertise. Um, I, you know, come from an information science background and in my PhD program, I was really the only person working on biomedical type questions. And so my, um, advisor was someone who worked on like privacy issues. My committee was full of people with really different and interesting backgrounds. And it was a very unique challenge, but also one that I consider extremely informative and useful to think about how do I talk about my particular area with these people who are like equally knowledgeable, but they just have knowledge in other areas. Um, and also how do I learn from them about the uh, things that they are good at. Um, I really tried when I was in my PhD program to take different courses that would hopefully build myself a toolbox of a diverse range of tools. So I took courses in, of course, quantitative types of things because that was my primary interest in data science, but also qualitative um, sorts of classes. Um, I took classes in survey design. And so really reaching out across those disciplinary boundaries and bringing in some of that knowledge and talking to those people and broadening your network, I think is crucially important in uh, data science. 
I also think it's really important to strive for work-life balance. Um, so this is my former dog, Ophelia, who passed away last year. And this is a picture from when I was working on my dissertation. And I would be at work all day and then come home and work on my dissertation all night. And she really didn't like that very much, understandably. So uh, she would like bark at me until I came to sit on the floor. And then I really loved this picture. I was sitting on the floor with my books and my computer and everything. And she came over and dropped her toy on my books. Like, come on, you got to stop. <laughs> so I, um, in my dissertation, they say you should never thank your pet and your acknowledgements, but I did. Uh, I said, finally, even though I know she'll never read this, I thank my dog Ophelia, my best friend and faithful companion for the last seven years. She provided many cuddles and listened very seriously when I talked through my research problems with her. And most importantly, she never hesitated to remind me that no matter how much serious work you have to do, you should always be sure you make time to play. Um, and I think, you know, especially now in this time when so many of us are working in a hybrid or virtual kind of space, those lines between home and work can kind of get blurred. And I think it's really super important that you make sure to strive to have those boundaries um, in whatever way works for you. I have an office that I, um, like a home office that I like close the door when the day is over. I don't have email on my phone. And I think those things are really important to make sure that um, we don't let work bleed over too much into life. Because I included a picture of my previous dog, I also have to include this gratuitous dog picture of my current dog, Lola. Uh, so there she is. <laughs> Um, I also think a very important lesson is to learn when to say yes and when to say no. Um, this is, I was trying to find, I used to have um, a actual printed out flow chart of when to say yes and when to say no to work opportunities. And I had that like actually posted on um, my screen so that when I would get an email and I would be super excited, like, oh my gosh, yes, I want to say yes to this. I would actually like take a moment and think through it and see, is this actually strategic for me to take on, or is it going to be something that I should say no to? Um, so this is not the exact chart. I wasn't able to find that one, um, but I think it covers a lot of the kinds of things that I try to think about when I'm approached with an opportunity. Um, one, is it in line with my vision and purpose? Is it something that is going to be strategic in terms of moving me in the direction that I want to go? Um, is it fun? <laughs> That's, of course, partly um, something to think about. Um, do you have the time? And if you don't have the time, how do you prioritize other things to make sure that you can do everything that you've agreed to. Another one that's not on here, but was on the original version that I was referencing was, does it give you an opportunity to work with someone who is going to be a good relationship to develop? So I think, again, very important to, um, especially earlier in your career, think very intentionally about the um, opportunities that you want to take and think about within the limited time that you have in your work day, um, are the things that you are agreeing to, um, the things that are going to move you in the direction that you want to go. Um, so this is a phrase that one of my um, committee members in my PhD would often say, don't compare your insides to other people's outsides. What that means is that when we present ourselves in public, um, we don't talk about all of the sort of dirty laundry that we have uh, going on inside of our heads. Um, people, you know, make their presentations, they look really polished, they, um, you know, post their happy picture on social media, and it can look as though I am such a failure, like I don't have it together in the way that this person does. But that's because you're comparing what's going on inside of your head with what other people are presenting to the outside world, which is not a fair comparison. I think imposter syndrome is very real. And that partly comes from this, where we look at somebody who's like wildly successful and has done a great job, but we don't see all of the failure that they went through to get there, the hard work that they put in, the times that they um, you know, we're told no. So I think it's really important to appreciate your own journey and recognize that um, 
it's not fair to compare yourself to other people um, and, uh, you know, recognize your own value. So um, I want to move to talking about some directions and opportunities in data science um, that I think are uh, useful to think about. Um, one is generative AI. I know that chat GPT is something that has been all over the place, um, but I think that it's a really useful tool to think about both in terms of how do we develop new generative AI um, techniques that are accurate, unbiased, um, and uh, you know, help help move the field forward, but also how do we use generative AI in our own work um, to be more efficient and to get things done? So I, just for fun, I asked uh, ChatGPT what message I should get across in a keynote for the Women in Data Science Conference, and it told me that I should make sure that we talk about diversity and inclusivity as essential for the success of data science, which I absolutely agree with, and how empowering women in underrepresented groups is crucial for driving innovation and advancing the industry as a whole. Absolutely true. So then I asked it, how would you get that message across in R code? Um, and it came up with this, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so I think uh, thinking about how we can use these tools to do our work better um, is really going to help us advance more quickly and um, do, do things more efficiently. I also want to mention um, the NIH policy for data management and sharing. For any of the librarians in the audience, I think this is an incredible opportunity to get more involved with working with researchers on data. Um, this is a new policy that went into effect earlier this year, and it requires researchers getting NIH funding to submit a data management and sharing plan and then um, comply with that plan and actually manage and share their data as they said that they were going to do. This is a, um, as I said, a new requirement and a lot of researchers haven't had to do this before and need a lot of assistance. So this is a really great way for librarians who are interested in dipping a toe into the data world um, to get involved. Um, there's lots of free training available and resources for librarians. Um, the network of the National Library of Medicine has a National Center for Data Services that offers um, a tremendous set of training resources. Um, so again, if you're wanting to get into this for the first time, this is a great kind of entree into that world. Related to that, as we start to have more open data, we have a lot of opportunities to take advantage of that data. And I think the open science movement is incredibly important. Open science is really an umbrella term that involves not just open data, but open access to the literature, um, open code, open educational resources. And this is a, a really great opportunity, not only to use and reuse and get more benefit from the data that we collect, um, but also just opening things up so that we can kind of see, um, how do I learn from the code that this person wrote? Or um, how do I use open peer review to improve my own ability to do peer review? So I think there's a lot of opportunity here. And I um, really hope that more researchers embrace openness as a practice. So with that, I will stop and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Federer. That was a wonderful talk. Um, just a reminder to the attendees, you're welcome to drop some questions in the Q&A box. So I'll start with a question from anonymous attendee. They ask, what programming language would you recommend an accidental data science librarian learn first? Well, I am very partial to R. Um, that is my favorite programming language. Um, Python is also very popular. Some people say that Python is easier to learn than R, but I actually have not found that to be the case personally. Um, but I think the answer really depends on what is the community that you're interacting with. Um, so if you're a librarian, um, I would say think about and kind of listen in on what are the conversations at your institution? What are the researchers they're using? Um, if you're a scientist, think about your research community, both within like your lab and also beyond. And I think the most useful programming language is going to be the one that um, is a kind of a universal language with people that you want to interact with. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I don't have a specific one that I would suggest, but again, I do think R is very good. 
Great, thanks. And I have a follow-up question. How did you uh, go about learning your first programming language? I learned through Coursera. So um, there is a data uh, science uh, specialization, I think it's called. It's offered through Johns Hopkins. And it was quite a while ago when I did it, but I understand that it's still available and they've provided some um, updated uh, content to reflect the, the way that the language evolves. Um, so I, I did that series of uh, courses. I will say I found it very difficult um, that uh, it was not like a super easy thing to pick up. And the thing that really made the most difference to me was, well, two things. So one was not just looking at the exercises that were in um, the, the MOOC, but also thinking about, okay, if I was going to do, if I was going to use this with my own data, what would that look like? So actually bringing in um, R to my own work and thinking about how uh, to apply the, the language to things that I was doing. So having that example of like a real world thing and not just take a look at this uh, Yelp restaurant review data, um, I think is really useful in um, helping you uh, to appreciate the things that you can do with the language and also learning um, the things that are gonna be most useful for your work. Um, the other one, and this is maybe a, a risky <laughs> proposition, but I, um, was so I was realizing that people at um, NIH really wanted to take courses in R and there really wasn't anyone that was offering that at the time. Um, so I was like, well, I'm going to just like start teaching an R course. I'm going to schedule it. I'm going to put it on uh, our calendar. People are going to sign up for it and that will force me to learn it. So I think um, in um, in medical education, there's the um, saying when you're in your residency that you see one, do one, teach one when it comes to a procedure. So I think that whole um, teaching thing really helps to cement knowledge. Um, and again, if you put, if you give yourself a deadline of I'm teaching a course in a month, you are pretty much forced to learn it. Um, so I think that um, there's definitely something to be said for it, whether it's formal teaching or mentoring. Um, I think that that really helps to um, cement that knowledge. And I will say I still teach R um, uh, as a little side gig um, in the evenings. And it's always, it's very, um, I think, useful to me to keep that curiosity going. Like there's, once you get to a certain point of, like there are the techniques that I use in working with my data and my research. And so there's kind of like a set of core uh, tools that I use, but I teach people that are coming from all different backgrounds. So it's really interesting to hear the questions that they ask and the, the things that they're trying, the problems they're trying to solve um, and the things that they want to do. And that helps me to explore things in areas that I wouldn't necessarily have um, thought to do myself. Um, so yeah. Nice, I love that phrase, see when, uh, see when teach one, that's wonderful. <laughs> So we have a question from Jen Sims. Jen asks, how does the NLM provide what we might call traditional cataloging services to data or data sets for the sake of folks finding the existence of data? Oh, very interesting question. Um, and one that I will give maybe a partial answer to. Um, so NLM, um, is a library. We have a physical library with books, um, but we also have data. Um, we have the National Center for Biotechnology Information, which has, I don't even know how many, many, many different data repositories with different types of data. Um, and some of that data, um, I would say probably most of that data comes in um, with user provided metadata. Um, so what, what you would call cataloging, I think. Um, some of that has like automated um, QA kinds of checks that go on with it um, to make sure that the data um, has everything it should have and um, is, is, you know, sort of on the face of it uh, looks accurate. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot of human curation that goes on with the data that we have, um, but it's the organization is so large that could be going on in certain spaces that I'm not aware of. Um, but one thing I will say is um, not just the traditional um, cataloging 
that you would think of um, with a, a, a catalog or actually looking at a resource and figuring out where it goes. An area that NLM has started to get into that I think is really interesting is um, automated indexing. So uh, as you may know, um, NLM hosts PubMed, uh, the kind of main um, biomedical uh, bibliographic database. So in the past, um, when an article came into PubMed, um, it would be indexed by a human uh, indexer that would involve assigning mesh terms, medical subject headings to the articles um, so that when people were coming to look for something in um, that uh, in PubMed, they would be able to find it even if the authors hadn't used the same terminology in their abstract as um, what the user was searching for. So if you think about cancer, for example, there's lots of different ways to say that cancer, neoplasm, tumor, malignancy. So if we did just like plain search, um, if the researcher in their abstract said neoplasm and you search for cancer, you wouldn't find it. So the point of MASH is that these articles get assigned these MESH headings so that um, regardless of the terminology, you can find it when you're searching for it. Um, as you can imagine, that's an incredibly time intensive process for um, an expert, um, not a librarian necessarily, but a subject matter expert to read the abstract, figure out what the article is about, assign it mesh terms. And eventually the, the pace of literature coming into PubMed just became, it became unsustainable and we, there was like a huge backlog. Um, so NLM started exploring automated indexing methods and developed a um, medical text indexing tool that can look at a text and apply uh, mesh terms to it. So that has been tremendously time-saving and um, we still have some human checks, but have automated a lot of that process. And so now I think it was like previously it would take six months for something to get indexed. Um, and now I think the turnaround time is more like 24 hours. So that's kind of a, a kind of diverged from the actual question that was asked. But I think that is a really interesting example of how we can bring data science techniques um, to improve processes and make things more efficient um, than if we had done them just with um, human effort. Great, thank you so much. Okay, we have a more personal question. How did you balance a full-time job and growing your skills when you first started? And I'm assuming they're referring to your switch to data science. Yeah, great question. Um, I would say for one thing, um, I, I wanna recognize the privilege that I've had um, to work with very, very supportive supervisors. Um, I both at UCLA when I was in the library and when I um, moved over to NIH, all of my supervisors have been just incredibly supportive of me um, pursuing uh, education and training. I would say that um, I also, I guess in some ways have a privilege of I um, I don't have kids other than my dog. And so I think it's a, you know, I definitely have the advantage of having like my weekends and evenings kind of free to pursue things. But for people who don't have those privileges, um, I think that it can be really useful just to explore. Um, like I said, there's lots of free resources that are available. Um, so think about things that, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to invest in a full degree or, um, you know, a, a formal uh, certificate even. There are certainly things that you can do on your own um, to pursue that. The other thing I would say, um, thinking about the time that I was working on my PhD, um, I was doing that, you know, while working full time, which certainly was a challenge as I think <laughs> you've gathered from the things I've shared today. Um, but I, I think one of the ways that I was able to be successful in doing that, besides having the support of um, my, my supervisors was really trying to make sure that I tied that work into the work that I was doing in my day job. So um, because of the fact that I was able to pursue um, a dissertation topic that was very connected to my work and really drew on my work experience, I won't get hugely into details of it, but essentially I was looking at um, data sets from three different NIH repositories, one of which was housed at NLM. Um, so it was not like I was doing something completely separate. Um, so a lot of the mental energy that I brought to my dissertation kind of like matched the mental energy, if you will, of the work that I was doing. And 
also built upon um, the relationships that I had in my institution and um, just the the type of, of knowledge that I was doing in my work. Thanks. It's great advice. We have time for one more question for you, Dr. Federer. So Belija asks, I'm excited by the prospect of AI. When something new comes your way, how do you approach or embrace it without becoming overwhelmed? <laughs> Great question. I know um, that the the term drinking from a fire hose is one that is often used in this setting because there is so much going on. Um, so I think that for me, I guess I would say um, that I am really interested in exploring things that are going to be related to my work. Um, there's quite a lot going on in data science, and some of that is just not really that relevant to me. Um, so, you know, there's, there's like economic kind of stuff and like, that doesn't, doesn't really interest me. Um, but I think like really focusing on the things that, um, can relate to this biomedical space that I'm in, um, makes it a little bit easier to focus. Um, I would also say that I try to, um, follow like kind of the trends in what the discussion is in the field to help me figure out what are the things that are going to be um, relevant to look into and maybe what's kind of a passing fad. So that might look like um, attending talks, attending conferences, hearing what people are talking about. Um, it might look like keeping up with the literature. Um, I don't really engage with it much anymore just because I have so much going on, but I had previously set up um, a PubMed search alert for um, articles that were like, I had a whole little search set up um, to bring me articles about data science and open science. And it was really interesting to like see things coming in that I was like, oh my gosh, I've never heard of this. And it's so, um, so cool. Um, so I think having your eyes open and thinking about how these things apply to your particular area of interest um, can make can help make it a little bit less overwhelming. But I think it also gives opportunities to come across things that may have unexpected connections to your research. Um, I think this is especially true with AI. There's I think it's so interesting like my my like <laughs> little hobby is trying to figure out, like push the boundaries of chat GPT and see what I can have it do. Um, I asked it to make a recipe for me the other day with a specific set of ingredients. And it came up with this like totally unique recipe that was delicious. Um, so I think like, again, just having that curiosity and willingness to explore um, can help um, to uh, decide where to focus your energies and attention. That's wonderful advice. I want to see that recipe that... <laughs> Um, well, Dr. Federer, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and answering all the questions from the audience. At this point, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and at 10.02 Pacific time, we'll return to begin our Connecting Health and the Environment Through Data panelists lightning talks. Thank you so much. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
Hello, welcome back from the break. We are about to begin our Connecting Health and the Environment Through Data panelist lightning talks. As a reminder, we will hear seven talks. And after all seven panelists have presented, I'm going to facilitate a group Q&A session. So while you're listening to all the lightning talks, please go ahead and drop your questions in the Q&A box and remember to upvote questions you'd like to hear answered during the Q&A session. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Julia Salzman. Dr. Salzman is an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Data Science, Biochemistry, and Statistics by courtesy. She received her AB in Mathematics from Princeton University, magna cum laude, and PhD from Stanford University in the Department of Statistics, supervised by Dr. Percy Diakonis. As a postdoctoral scholar in Dr. Patrick Brown's lab, Dr. Salzman developed statistical algorithms that led to the discovery of a ubiquitous expression of circular RNA missed by other computational and experimental approaches for decades. Her research spans the interface of statistical methodology and genomics, aiming to use data-driven experiments to uncover organizing principles of biological regulation, historically focused on RNA processing. Recently, her group has introduced a new approach to sequencing analysis called NOMAD that performs inference on raw sequencing data bypassing genome alignment. This approach is providing new insights into RNA regulation, including RNA editing and splicing, among many other applications. The title of her talk today is Genomic Data Science for Planetary Health. Welcome, Dr. Salzman. Thank you so much. Can you see me and my screen? We can see you and your screen. Yes. Okay. I can't really see my own screen, but I'm so, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to change it change the slides, but, um, okay. I'm really grateful for this. And so I am, um, if you wanna give me any suggestions, otherwise I can kind of just go from it. And if I think you have access to my slides cause I put them in the drive, maybe I could say next slide. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Um... Sonam, would you be able to pull up her slides for her? And Julia, you can go ahead and stop sharing and begin your talk and Sonam will pull up the slides. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share. There we go. Okay, um, well, I'm just going to find my own slides. So I am so grateful again for the introduction to be here. I wanna tell you today about um, our work in using what, um, Okay, yeah, are you playing my slide? Um, yes, work in sustainable genomics, um, which is totally unpublished for the most part. Um, and it is based on um, reflection, actually, reflection that I did during the pandemic, really, next slide, thinking about how, um, next slide, um, thinking about how the field of biomedical data science and my own training in biomedical data science could, help inform planetary health and data science and data discovery in planetary health specifically. Um, next next animation. And so because partly, as you know, this was motivated by the pandemic, but also I wanted to think about whether we were able to contribute the tools that we use to study problems in human genomics to studying problems in human in human caused climate change. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so a variety of human impacts on the environment, from population growth to climate change. Um, let's please next animation have um, have really made um, or enabled a number of important um, data scientific problems to be. Um, opened up ones that, okay, next animation, please. Um, okay, so some of these include the emergence of new pathogens. Oh, please, next. Um, why don't you please scroll through all the animations here? Um, okay, thank you so much. And so emergence of new pathogens, including emergence of um, antibiotic resistance in them, expansion of vector ranges, 
Um, there's been also been ecological destabilization due to climate change, which means that there are species that are coming extinct. Um, could you please um, or and um, we also have very poor ways of monitoring ecological landscapes, including plants and animals that are destabilized during climate change. How about I'll use a, a thumb when I'm asking to please advance it so I don't repeat myself too much. Okay. Um, and uh, because of climate change also, there's uh, a huge importance of being able to engineer and modify crops and also just design crop um, crop layouts so that they can maximize food production in the, in the context of um, increasing climate change. So um, I'm sorry for this sort of fragment. Okay, so please, please keep advancing the slides. Thank you. Um, okay. So um, all of these problems, they're very disparate from a biological perspective, but as a trained statistician, I thought maybe there's a unifying approach from a data scientific perspective that could enable us to develop new algorithms that would allow ourselves and hopefully many, many other people to make inroads into problems that simply can't be solved today. And it made me wonder if there was um, a unifying approach to genomics that we could develop that would be applicable to plants, microbes, and all species. Okay, and just taking a cue from human genomics, it had to be a different kind of approach because even for a single species, the human species, it has been hundreds of millions, if not more, billions of dollars and hundreds of people years to assemble a single reference genome, which is the way that the field of genomics and biomedicine approaches biological systems analysis. So we need a new approach. Okay, so I'm going to take a cue from a different field, which is archeology. span And in archeology, span the classical approach is to dig in one spot and dig very deeply. Um, and recently they've been developing and using a new technology called brown, ground penetrating radar. No need to choose an excavation site by hand. Instead, you can survey large swaths of land and essentially uncover many important cues of organizing principles of ancient civilizations. So could we do a similar thing for the genomic era? Is there ground penetrating radar for genomics? Okay. Please advance. Okay. And it could have enormous applications if we do. Okay, so I want to just tell you about one simple um, example and then please go ahead. Um, okay, so what, what I'm going to tell you about is um, a new approach to genomics, and it's going to have to bypass a reference genome or the, the human reference genome in, ana in analogy, it's going to have to work on any species without knowing its reference genome. And this is because of the enormous complexity and richness of the world from bacteria to viruses, even to plants. It should be able to work without any ecosystem is that uh, for any for any member of the ecosystem. And as a statistician, one of the most important properties of this kind of approach is to have a valid statistical formulation. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but it's enormously important from the perspective of biological discovery. And I would argue that the lack of statistics and data science in biology um, prevents us from much more rapid progress in human health and planetary health. Okay, and this algorithm should be easy and fast. Okay, all right. Let's just please scroll, um, keep going, uh, keep going, please. Okay, so, and just keep scrolling. Um, yeah, so we tried, basically, one of the tasks that we've been able to perform is to take patients that have been infected with Omicron or um, Delta, but not knowing which strain they've been infected with and not knowing anything about the fact that they even have SARS-CoV-2 just know they have some virus. The question is,
could we design a statistical algorithm before anyone ever told us about SARS-CoV-2 that would classify people that had Omicron into one group and people that had Delta into another? Okay, and the short answer to that question is yes, we can, which I think is a really remarkable and exciting um, finding because it means now we can survey plants that may have different variants of different viruses and identify which plants are infected with which viruses and even what viruses they are. So I'm going to skip ahead. I know I'm really out of time. So please skip all the way until the very last slide. Um, yeah, so we've been able to apply this algorithm to eelgrass, which is an oceanic species, like all the way, <laughs> please keep going. Um, uh, an oceanic species of plant that is critical for carbon capture. It's critical for oceanic ecosystems. It is critical for coastal um, maintenance of coastal, like prevention of co coastal erosion. Um, and We've been able to make discoveries very fast in this organism that no one has ever been able to make. And it has enormous implications for um, rest, species restoration, ecosystem monitoring, carbon capture. And I would love to talk to anyone who's interested about this. Um, it's based on Nomad, which is a publication that you can email me if you can't find, but if you Google Scholar it, it should be available. There are multiple versions of this now. There's a Nomad 2, which is ultra fast. Um, and it's really, I think, bringing genomics into the realm of statistics and data science for discovery. And I think it's, it's, an ex it's very exciting to me to be able to, as a statistician, biologist, um, impact problems that are important for planetary science in a very, very new way. So I'd love to talk to anyone who's interested in the future. Um, I just love to flash the acknowledgement slide just because of the people. So if you could just scroll for that. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to anyone later. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Salzman. If you have a question for Dr. Salzman, please drop it in the Q&A. Um, she may or may not be able to be here for the Q&A, but if you have a question, I'll definitely get it to her after the session. Um, so at this point, I would like to introduce our second panelist, Dr. Aini Jun. Dr. Aini Jun is a molecular genetic pathology fellow at Stanford Healthcare. Prior to her clinical training in pathology at Stanford, she majored in biological engineering at MIT, conducted her doctoral research in national air quality at the Harvard School of Public Health, graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Medical School, and the title of her talk today is Connecting the Dots from Bioengineering to Public Health to pathology. Welcome, Dr. Jen. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, as you can see from the topic of my talk, this will be a very broad overview, highlighting the different lenses through which we can look at environmental health, from bioengineering to public health to pathology. So after college, I spent a year at the um, MIT bioengineering department to study processes that regulate DNA damage and repair pathways. And during this year, I became very intimately familiar with the enzymatic processes that our body has in place to protect our DNA against environmental exposures through DNA repair processes. And so you can see on the figure on the right uh, that depicts many different factors that cause DNA damage and the different types of DNA that damage that can occur and multiple downstream effects of the damaged DNA. And I learned that there's a homeostatic process that maintains the integrity of DNA in our bodies and protect against carcinogenesis and cell death. And so in addition to the links between DNA damage and carcinogenesis, there are systemic impacts of environmental exposures. So for example, PM 2.5 or fine particulate matter is one of the most harmful components of air, air pollution. And these small particles can penetrate deep into the lungs and the chemical components that are um, absorbed into our blood and circulate in our bodies can have systemic impacts. So um, exposure to air pollution is linked with a wide range of health outcomes, including cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease. And so during my PhD, one of the things I did was a meta-analysis of a number of epidemiological studies uh, that included numerous cohorts and exposure metrics 
to demonstrate that, de that traffic-related particles can have a broad range of cardiovascular effects from uh, impacting cardiac autonomic function, systemic inflammation, robotic activity, risk of hypertension, and ischemic stroke. Um, so environmental exposures don't occur in silos. As you know, multiple exposures occur simultaneously and synergistic effects are challenging to model because of those confounding relationships that exist between them, um, but very important. And so not only is poor air quality itself linked to adverse health outcomes, but it interacts with other environmental factors that may have synergistic impacts on health. And so this is a study uh, in collaboration with the US EPA um, and utilize a national mortality and air quality database to conduct this uh, epidemiological study that assessed the impact of temperature on the ozone mortality association. And this graph here shows the, this dose response relationship where at a higher temperature range, the risk estimate for ozone related, related mortality became larger. And so this suggested that high temperatures may exacerbate those physiological responses to ozone exposure. And not only are there potential synergistic effects of simultaneous environmental exposures, the trends of these environmental risk factors can affect each other. And so this is a study uh, where I found that air quality trends have already been impacted by weather trends. And those impacts have already had impact, uh, uh, had an impact on adverse, uh, adversity on health. And so this, um, this study was utilizing national databases in ozone and uh, fine parts fine particles over a 19-year period and uh, also corresponding mortality data. And essentially what I did here was derive the difference between air quality trends with and without the adjustment for weather variables and compare the two to estimate a weather penalty on air quality. And then utilizing the risk estimates of ozone-related mortality and uh, can't do by related mortality, I estimated the weather penalty on air quality was associated with over 20,000 excess deaths over a 19 year study period in the United States alone. And so, um, as you can see also in these figures, there were important regional differences as well, uh, where certain regions were more heavily impacted. And so not only are there region regional differences in the risk uh, posed by environmental, environmental exposures, there are also important social disparities on how envir environmental exposures can impact health. And so this was a national study on the association between uh, outdoor temperature and sudden infant death syndrome, where I found that there was an increased, um, that increased outdoor temperature was associated with unexplained infant mortality or sudden infant death syndrome. And what was really striking to me here was the significant difference in these risks between white and black infants. And of note, some infant death syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion and it's determined by pathologists after an autopsy. And during my residency in pathology, uh, we, we have to do at least 30 um, of autopsies as well. Um, and national health databases depend really on the accuracy of these diagnoses rendered by physicians like pathologists. And so pathology is an important field that contributes to a tremendous amount of health data available. And molecular pathology, which is what I'm training in right now, in particular has contributed to a tremendous amount of volume of data in DNA sequencing. And the reason for this is that sequencing tumor DNA is becoming and is the standard of care for many types of cancers, including lung, colon cancer, leukemias, lymphomas, and, and the list is just growing by the day. It keeps me very busy. Um, and with this growing availability of molecular data, there are growing opportunities in a field called molecular pathologic epidemiology. And so um, I had the opportunity to work with a molecular pathologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital to help further define this field. And so taking these integrations further, we can think about integrating pharmacology with molecular pathological epidemiology, it's a mouthful. Um, but to understand how drugs interact with specific tumors within specific um, patient population, this multidisciplinary approach of integrating pharmacology, epidemiology, and molecular pathology is really important. 
And uh, the diagram in the middle there, with drug in the middle, um, that really de depicts the rationale for this. And so just to explain this further, there are a variety of endogenous and exogenous factors, including drugs, that modify the phenotypes of cancer. And so it's a combination of these factors that lead to heterogeneity between patients within the same disease category, like colon cancer. Um, and so this, uh, these combination of factors that manifest in the morphology of the tumor cells, as well as the cells surrounding the tumor. And so there's a tremendous research um, effort going on to characterize these tumor microenvironments. And there are also a lot of exciting AI applications to identify features uh, that are challenging to characterize by a human pathologist's eyes. Um, and so ultimately, by elucidating and capturing these complex interplay between the environment, the tumor, patient level factors, we can start creating an integrated approach to really guide therapy and uh, prevention approaches that are uh, personalized to each patient, not the goal of precision medicine and precision oncology. And so, uh, so data science is integral to many aspects of understanding health. You know, at the molecular level, bioinformatics is essential to identify relevant mutations um, and, and distinguish that from noise and also uh, to, to really identify molecular signatures that are relevant to disease. Um, and at the tissue or anatomic level, it's important to identify features and patterns that are relevant to patient prognosis. Um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, large patient core studies are needed to, uh, to, to understand staging criteria. And those are revised pretty regularly. And so, um, uh, sorry, are you still able to see my screen with the full patient full yes, presentation? Sure. Okay, see. okay. <laughs> um, and so data science is really needed to integrate across all of these levels. Um, so, so yeah, thank you again so much for connecting the dots with me today and going on this whirlwind tour uh, of my various interests and past experiences, you know, from studying DNA damage to epidemiological studies. Um, and on air quality and climate and now molecular pathology. And so hopefully this really shed light on the different perspectives on environmental health um, and, and, and how data science is essential in all of these areas. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Jen. That was great. Next up is our third panelist, Saskia Comis. Saskia is a third year PhD student in the Interdisciplinary Environment and Resources Program at Stanford, concentrating in environmental epidemiology and statistical methods. Prior to Stanford, she completed master's degrees in statistics and public health at Yale University. Her research addresses the early life health effects of adverse environmental exposures, particularly air pollution and agricultural point sources. The title of her talk today is Exposure Uncertainty in Environmental Epidemiology, Statistical Approaches and Opportunities. Welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, today I will be giving a like brief overview of a couple projects that I'm working on. Um, my research uses tools from environmental epidemiology, statistics, and data science to answer important questions around data sparse environmental exposures, community level exposures to environmental pollutants, and uncertainty in epidemiologic modeling. Um, and I'm going to go into a few questions that I work in in those areas. Um, so broadly, I study environmental epidemiology, which is the study of how environmental factors affect human health. And understanding the health burden of environmental pollution is a critical public health problem, but the research pathway from pollutant to health association is complicated and involves multiple data sources and levels of uncertainty. Um, we know of numerous processes that lead to environmental pollution, such as oil and gas activities, wastewater production, and animal agriculture. However, we often have minimal data on environmental pollution sources, including just knowing where the, uh, knowing their locations. Um, and this is especially true of unregulated and underregulated industries, which lack regulatory permits and publicly information publicly available information on their geographic locations, activities, and emissions. Um, and this is where data science can come in. Remote sensing and machine learning models provide a promising set of tools 
sorry, my lights just went off, um, a promising set of tools for addressing this first problem, which is knowing fine-grained location information on sources. And a second part of this is that these sources of environmental pollution may be located close enough to where people live and work that they can cause significant community level exposure. So knowing the locations of facilities is a key first data science challenge um, in understanding health effects. And I'm going to first talk about that aspect of this pipeline with respect to detection of concentrated feeding, uh, concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs. Um, CAFOs represent a potential source of, uh, 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 represent a potential pollution point source. Um, they are facilities that can find animals at high densities over time. So high densities means more than a thousand beef cattle for a large CAFO or more than 125,000 chickens, 2,500 hogs. Um, and such a high density of animals produces a lot of manure and other potential pollutants that can leak into the community if not properly regulated. However, there's high uncertainty in even how many CAFOs there are in the United States. Um, it's estimated in 2020 that there were about 20,000 CAFOs, but only about 6,000 of them held permits. And as a result, we don't really know that much about where CAFOs are located. And up until recently, mapping CAFOs relied on manual resource intensive enumerations using maps or ground investigations, um, which does not scale over time and geography if you want to do this for the entire United States. So to address this lack of data, researchers at the Regulation, Evaluation and Government Governance Lab at Stanford Law School um, developed machine learning models that use high resolution satellite imagery to detect and map CAFOs, a method that's generally useful for other pollution point sources beyond CAFOs as well. And knowing the geographic locations of CAFOs and their approximate construction dates allows us to investigate important public health and environmental justice questions that we previously just lacked the environmental exposure data to answer. Um, when the RegLab researchers applied their model to North Carolina, they detected 15% more poultry CAFOs than were previously known to exist. So we have been working to characterize the relationship between e environmental justice metrics, such as race, race ethnicity data um, and socioeconomic factors and proximity to CAFOs accounting for construction events. So here I present a few preliminary work, uh, results from our work. Um, looking at demographic shifts around construction of poultry CAFOs, trying to answer the questions of do people move to or away from CAFOs when they're constructed, and do these patterns of movement differ across different demographic and socioeconomic groups? So to briefly break down these plots, um, each arrow represents a cluster of census geographies, which were clustered using a k-means algorithm. And the start of each arrow is the, uh, sorry, the tail of each arrow is the um, value of either the exposure on the x-axis or the demographic variable on the y-axis in 2010. And then the, the point of the arrow is the value in 2020. So this is showing changes in exposure concurrent with changes in demographic information. And what we see, uh, and sorry, the left, plot, the left panel is for white population changes and for the right panel is for changes in Hispanic population. And what we observe is that increases in exposure are generally associated with either small decreases or no changes in the white populations. Whereas um, in areas with large increases in CAFO exposure, we tend to see in concurrent increases in Hispanic population. And to put some more precise numbers on this, if you look only at the census areas that have increases in exposure, there's an increase in Hispanic population of on average 36 people, where we, whereas we have a decrease in white population of about 23 people. But if we look at areas that have no change in um, exposure, we don't see that distinction. So the first part of that work addressed this question about sources. Um, my second area of study focuses on the pathway between the existence of a pollution point source at a given location and how this relates to health relevant levels of human exposure. So this part of the pathway. Studying the effects of air pollution and other pollutant point sources requires surrogate measures of personal exposure since we rarely know the actual dose of a pollutant that someone might receive via inhalation, adjust, ingestion, or a dermal route. And oftentimes we know very little about the potential or absorbed 
dose. And so we have to use a proxy measure like proximity or a combination of measured and model pollutant concentrations. And as a result, in environmental epidemiology studies, we often need to account for numerous sources of uncertainty, both in terms of how we define an exposure and how we think of uncertainty in our exposure values relative to our health associations. So I explore, explore those two questions in two ways. Firstly, I think about um, how we define exposure buffers around a pollutant point source. So circular buffers with an a priori defined radius are very commonly used to um, capture what it means to be exposed to a pollution point source because they represent a simple metric um, reflecting risk of just living in proximity to a hazard. However, the choice of buffer size or even shape um, varies widely across the literature for different hazards. So for example, for CAFOs, it ranges anywhere from a kilometer to 15 kilometers being defined as exposed. And my objective is to develop um, a pipeline for producing data and health data informed exposure definitions, allowing us to estimate the appropriate radius and buffer size, incorporating spatially smooth variation over geography and individuals. Um, and while I don't have time to talk about it in detail, I'm working on simulation studies and um, health data applications to answer this question. And the second problem that I consider um, is how to propagate uncertainty from our exposure models into our health models. Um, and this is a methodologically relevant question because many environmental epidemiology studies are done in two stages. In the first stage, the pollutant is modeled to fill in spatiotemporal gaps in the actual data that we observe. And then the output of that model is used, is used as input to the health model. And it would make sense that the health observations should be linked with exposure estimates that have lower uncertainty um, and that the ones with higher uncertainty should contribute less to the overall health effect estimate. However, um, in many studies, exposure uncertainty is frequently ignored or accounted for in a very simple manner. So in my research, we developed a set of Bayesian methods to appropriately carry forward uncertainty in the exposure distribution into the health model. And I will just very briefly touch on an application of that to studying the risk of stillbirth um, associated with fine particulate matter exposure, which we actually heard nicely about in the previous presentation. Um, so in this study, we modeled fine particulate matter across several counties in New Jersey in our first stage. And then in the second stage, we modeled the number of stillbirths as a function of lagged particulate matter exposure. And we observed that elevated ambient levels of fine particulate matter three days prior to the delivery were associated with an increased risk of stillbirth using the method that we proposed, which is the highlighted, uh, highlighted on the right-hand side of this panel. Specifically, an interquartile range increase in exposure three days prior to the delivery was associated with a 20% increased risk of stillbirth. And while I don't have time to talk about all the methods in detail. I just want to highlight that the previous, the other methods often either couldn't detect this association or did it with less certainty. They had wider um, credible intervals. So our intention with proposing this new method was to help us both perform better inference and better quantify our confidence and uncertainty in the exposure health association. I saw um, um, yeah. Oh, great. I was just gonna ask you if you could share a few final thoughts before you move on. Yep, so that was everything I had to say. I just want to thank um, all of my advisors and I'm looking forward to the rest of the panel. Perfect, thank you so much. So I'd like to remind the attendees to please continue to add questions for our lovely panelists in the Q&A box. We'll address them after all the lightning talks. Next up is our fourth panelist, Dr. Ahimsa porter Sumchai. She is the founder, medical director, and principal investigator of the Hunters Point Community Biomonitoring Program. Dr. Samchai's leadership in the environmental health and justice movement began on the morning of February 19th, 1992, after signing the death certificate of her father, George Donald Porter, a career longshore walking boss and shipping clerk who died prematurely from pulmonary asbestosis. Protégé of Carlton Benjamin Goodlett, PhD, MD, graduate of the University of California at San Francisco School of Medicine and Stanford University Department of Surgery postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Sumchai was appointed to head the Palo Alto 
VA Toxic Environmental Registry in 1997 and simultaneously returned home to the neighborhood of her childhood to establish children's clinics as a physician specialist with the San Francisco Department of Public Health. The title of her talk today is Community Exposure Research in Bayview Hunters Point. Welcome, Dr. Sunchai. Thank you so very, very much for uh, your uh, introduction and the uh, privilege of uh, joining such a, a, a distinguished panel. Uh, those of you on the panel will appreciate how much uh, the work that I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, integrates uh, with the work that you're doing. Uh, the primary difference is that uh, I'm going to have to leave the uh, ivory uh, towers of uh, academia uh, and put boots on the ground uh, in the neighborhood uh, that I grew up in to talk to you about uh, co a community uh, exposure uh, science and some of the work that we are doing that is uh, drawing a lot of media attention and uh, has uh, resulted in us receiving a number of uh, prestigious uh, awards in the area uh, of exposure uh, science. Uh, Bayview uh, Hunters Point is located in Southeast San Francisco. It is heavily industrialized. It is heavily polluted. It is a shoreline community that is a microcosm of the types of risks that uh, shoreline communities face throughout the world as a result of sea level rise, uh, groundwater rise, and climate uh, change. Uh, Hunters Point is situated in a region that for 10,000 years was uh, occupied uh, by the Ohlone people. Uh, and in the uh, pre-World War II area, uh, era uh, was uh, populated uh, very, very heavily uh, by African uh, Americans as a result of a redevelopment and gentrification. Uh, the community has become more diverse uh, there are approximately 37,000 people uh, in the 94124 zip code, but we're going to be focusing our attention on the one mile perimeter uh, surrounding a system of three federal Superfund designated properties uh, at the Hunters Point Naval Shipyard. Uh, where the atom bomb little boy was picked up uh, on the morning of uh, July 15, 1945 on its way uh, to Hiroshima and where about 100 ships were returned after uh, detonations of uh, atomic bombs, including a plutonium bomb uh, in 1946 uh, in the South uh, Pacific. It is a community that I am proud to say has offered a, a national model uh, for environmental justice collaborative uh, organizing. Uh, it is a community that has led the way in the area of community-based uh, exposure science. And I wanna talk with you about the multiple modalities that we are integrating into a model for community exposure a research that we believe will advance environmental public health, promote citizen science, uh, create a toxic registry and offer us a model uh, that can be transferred and applied to environmental justice overburdened communities throughout uh, the nation. So the next slide uh, is a, uh, let's see, uh, Yes, uh, we're just going to uh, start with the uh, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences definition of exposure science, the uh, study of our contact, uh, such as by swallowing, breathing, or touching with environmental factors and their effects on the human body. Research in this field aims to determine the types, levels, and combinations of exposures people experience and how these exposures affect human health and disease over a lifetime. Let me uh, begin by emphasizing that in 1997, I uh, was appointed to head uh, the Palo Alto Veterans Administration Toxic Registry, the VA system in the United States has uh, the uh, country's largest uh, toxic uh, registry. And as part of my responsibilities, uh, I interviewed uh, the atomic veteran survivors 
of the post-World War II <clears throat> uh, Operation Crossroads uh, detonations. And I also uh, conducted urinary screenings for depleted uranium on uh, Persian Gulf uh, uh, veterans. Um, but uh, let's uh, begin by looking at uh, the target uh, population, uh, the target community, uh, and the next slide is one uh, that is um, taken from an advanced screening and mapping tool that I hope that you are all aware of. It is so beautiful, it is fun, and it is extremely informational. It is the EPA EJ screen, uh, and it uh, works like Google Maps. You uh, open it, uh, it uh, will geolocate for you. You can type in your address or location or coordinates uh, in the address bar, and it's going to uh, give you an indicator pin uh, in the situation that we're uh, focused on now. I place the indicator pin at the main gate entry to the United States Radiological Defense Laboratory Complex that is situated on the uh, radiation and chemical contaminated shoreline uh, of a system of three federal and one state uh, Superfund site. Uh, the uh, EPA EJ screen uh, draws out the one mile uh, perimeter uh, for me. It also estimates how many people are in that uh, a one mile uh, perimeter or buffer zone. Uh, in this case, there are about 23,000 people. Uh, and uh, it also is going to allow me to color in uh, the uh, degree of exposure to um, 11 environmental justice indicators. And uh, to make life simple for you, if the colors are bright yellow to red, uh, then uh, it means it's a dangerous level of uh, exposure. Uh, and this next slide uh, gives us a, a EPA EJ screen uh, mapping uh, using your uh, percentiles. It compares uh, the uh, percentile in the specific region with the state and the national uh, percentiles. And anything in yellow, uh, orange or red is above the 90th percentile. So bam, uh, you get a sense just by looking at this simple mapping of how exposed this community is. The particular indicators we're looking at are health disparities, low life expectancy, heart disease, and asthma. Uh, you also see red or orange for uh, fine particulates, diesel particulates, traffic uh, uh, proximity, NATA air cancer risk, uh, Superfund proximity, uh, lead-based paint, uh, and there are, uh, there are several others. I believe hazardous waste sites uh, is in the um, uh, EJ indicators that are, uh, you know, uh, 90 to 100 percent higher than what is faced by uh, the majority of people in the United States of America. So uh, the next slide is a histogram, and all of you understand that a histogram simply uh, uh, ranks a uh, number of indicators uh, based on the degree of exposure. It just lines them up, and you can simply see, without even understanding the specific impacts of each indicator, uh, that in blue, based on the percentile in the United States, uh, many of these uh, EJ uh, indicators are uh, approaching uh, the 100 uh, percentile. So it is not hyperbole to say that the community that I grew up in, the community that I am studying, the community that I'm presenting to you today is one of the most EJ overburdened uh, communities uh, in the United States of America. The next slide is a uh, slide that uh, addresses the principal modality that we are using to uh, determine direct cause and effect relationships between these exposures and expressions of Hi, disease. Dr. I'm yes. sorry to interrupt. Um, would you be willing to share a few final thoughts so we can uh, allow time for all of our panelists? 
Of course. Uh, the uh, kit that you have before you uh, is this kit. Uh, and it is uh, simply a urinalysis that allows the uh, exposed person to uh, uh, generate a urine specimen that is sent to a laboratory, a national laboratory. And in about seven or 10 days, there is a result uh, that uh, documents exposure to 35 potential uh, toxicants as well as some nutrient uh, elements. We also see deficiencies uh, in nutrient elements. And uh, the next slide uh, is a, a slide that um, translates from the individual to the uh, population level using a uh, pinning the uh, location of uh, residents and workers who have these chemicals detected in concentrations exceeding reference range. Uh, the specific elements that we're looking here are radioactive biomarkers. They include cesium, uh, uranium, thorium, thallium, uh, strontium, uh, cadmium, uh, and uh, a platinum. And then there is a specific urinalysis that we conducted that looks at products of nuclear fission. And there are people with uh, plutonium uh, that have been uh, detected, most of whom live within uh, the six block perimeter of the base. In fact, most of the clustering that we're seeing, not only with the radioactive biomarkers, but with radiogenic cancers uh, is in residents and workers who are within uh, the six mile, uh, excuse me, the six block perimeter the base. So that's the work uh, that we're doing. Uh, the final slide uh, is uh, the uh, model uh, of the Hunters Point Biomonitoring Foundation, protect, detect, uh, prevent. Uh, and again, our goal is towards the establishment of a toxic registry uh, and a model for community uh, exposure science uh, that can be uh, transferred uh, to communities throughout the nation. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumchai. Um, I just wanted to share if any of the panelists have any Q&As they would like to answer in the chat, please feel free to answer them in the chat because um, we might not have as much time as scheduled for the Q&A session, so please feel free to do that. Um, but at this time, next we will hear from our fifth panelist, Sheen Yuen Allison Zhang. Dr. Zhang's research focuses on understanding the exposome, particularly how the exposome affects human health. She has studied the human exposome in multiple environmental settings, including the hospital, during wildfires, and in diseases such as Crohn's disease. Her current work also includes developing wearable sensors to profile the human exposome that aid precision environmental health. The title of her talk is Precision Environmental Health Monitoring by Longitudinal Exposome and Multiomics Profiling. Welcome, Dr. Zhang. Thank you for the nice introduction. So my research focuses on the intersection between environmental exposures and the, ter the fancy term we give it is the exposome and the health. So the exposome is a rather new concept. It's, uh, by definition, it includes all the exposures across one's lifetime. And that uh, includes many aspects of our life that includes air, water, soil, food, lifestyle, and social factors. We are particularly interested in the airborne exposure. Why do we study exposome? The answer is quite simple because it affects our health. The external environment will interact with our internal environment and generate a health outcome. And this can be either good or bad. And uh, thanks for my uh, previous presenters. Everyone's now familiar with the PM 2.5. And uh, once inhaled, the particular matter can go to uh, different parts of the lung and cause adverse health uh, outcomes. Both short-term and long-term exposures to PM 2.5 could cause symptoms not only in the respiratory uh, systems, but also cardiovascular functions and also uh, brain functions. So how do we study the exposure? Traditionally, people use monitoring stations to study the exposure, or I have to say, to study the particular matter. Those are shaped like structures outdoors. And there are many drawbacks associated with these uh, monitor stations. Number one is being low resolution. Plus there's, it is a fixed weather station, so there's usually only one in a large geographic area. So it cannot provide a precise personal exposure information. 
Number two being low information. It tells you the total concentrations of particular matter, but it cannot tell you exactly what chemicals or biologicals are present. You do not know if there's any pathogens, pesticides, or plastics that are in that air. So under this scheme, we developed the personal exposure monitoring scheme. So we use a variable device to capture the exposure at the personal level. That way we can profile the personal exposures to great detail. So on the left shows a few generations of the variable devices that we use to capture the personal exposure. The micro PM and the UPAS are the ones that we got from the market. We uh, adapt these devices to fit our needs. And the pad is our newest uh, development in the lab that we develop uh, to fit our research need is quite small. You probably can't see it. It's quite small and powerful. So it collects both the chemical and biological exposure from air. And uh, with the biological exposure that includes all the bacteria, fungi, plants, and animals, and the chemicals just includes all the nasty stuff that you could think of in the air. So, and then we use overnight analysis that is next generation sequencing and mass spectrometry to analyze these uh, personal exposure to great detail. So what we can do with our uh, method, we can detect over 2,500 species using our uh, pipeline and uh, device that includes all domains of life, uh, bacteria, fungi, virus, and uh, animals. On the chemical side, it's a similar uh, story. We can detect uh, over 3,000 chemical features and the top class includes pesticides, personal care plus, uh, products, plasticizers, and carcinogens. Uh, also, with, uh, with our research I didn't show here, we found out that the components of the exposure is highly personal, and also location and season has a huge impact on the exposome components. And we are more interested in how the exposome affects health. So we performed a deep multi-omic profiling of an individual. Uh, that includes the gut microbiome, metabolomics, proteomics, uh, cytokines, and the routine blood tests. We want to see how the external exposures could affect these internal multiomics. So um, uh, here is a very busy graph, but on the left, you can see many uh, uh, edges and nodes, and the, each of the line connecting the two nodes is a correlation. We found almost 9,000 correlations between the external environment with the internal environment. So here's an example of the exposure correlates with the gut microbiome. Uh, we found over 1,000 correlations between the external exposure with the gut microbiome. On the right shows uh, a couple interesting uh, correlation patterns. So on the top is a list piece. This one is believed to involve inflammation and various diseases. We found this uh, micro, micro is, is uh, positively correlated with all the chemical components from the environment, but negatively correlated with the biological components. On the bottom shows you, uh, the micro use bureau, which is considered mostly protective micro in the gut. This one has a different story. It only negatively correlates it, uh, correlate with the chemical components, but positively correlates with the biological components. And uh, this is a very interesting pattern. And right now we are running studies in uh, different uh, inflammatory uh, bowel disease participants to see if this is also the case uh, in a disease setting. And uh, we also uh, took a look at the clinically uh, routinely tested blood tests, and we use those as health markers to see how, in general, the exposure impacts health. So we found that almost 77% uh, of those variations could be explained by exposure components. On the right shows an example of glucose. Uh, the green band shows the normal range, and this is one with uh, abnormal values. We found both biological and chemical components that correlates with the variations of the glucose levels in the blood. This, of course, opens an interesting avenue for us that 
by monitoring one's exposure, we could get insight onto one's health. And of course, these are just correlations. We need to perform further experiments to uh, determine the causal relationship of these correlations. And uh, I would just like to end on the acknowledgement slide. Thank you all for having me. Thank you for listening to my talk. And I also like to thank my uh, wiser and lab members and also funding sources. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. Um, I see there's a lot of activity in the Q&A box. Some of our panelists are answering questions, so please feel free to ask questions and read the answers they've provided for you. Um, next up is our sixth panelist, Dr. Caroline Glidden. Dr. Glidden is a postdoctoral fellow in the Mordecai Lab interested in the ecology of wildlife and human diseases, global change biology, and biodiversity conservation. Dr. Glidden currently studies the eco-epidemiology of leishmaniasis and the effect of land use change on vector-borne and zoonotic disease dynamics. The title of her talk today is Leveraging Data Science to Prevent Disease Emergence. Welcome, Dr. Glidden. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, let's see. Okay, um, so Let's travel to the southwest of the Amazon forest in Madre de Dios, Peru, which you can see the location on the map on the right side of the screen. Um, so in 2011, the interoceanic inter highway pictured here um, and represented by the yellow line on the map was built through this department. Um, as you can see too, you know, as in the Amazon, this department is um, really heavily, heavily forested. And prior to this road being built, there is really few ways to travel via motor, um, via motor vehicle throughout the region. So in some areas, this road building has really spurred rapid environmental change. In the picture on the top hand, top right hand of the screen um, is a papaya plantation along the road and in the bottom right corner is an area converted to um, pasture land for cattle. So you can see these areas of intense land conversion that are bordering the um, pre-existing forest there. Um, so this highway was built to increase trade and access to resources throughout the region, which undoubtedly has really great benefits to human health and livelihood. Um, however, the, this debilitating infection pictured here has concurrently been rapidly emerging in the area or has um, there's been a ton of new cases that have arisen um, and it continues to pose a public health risk. So this infection is caused by Leishmania, Leishmania parasites, which cause these painful skin lesions and also can deteriorate mucosal linings. Um, that is really painful. Um, and the disease is called American cutaneous Leishmaniasis. So the Leishmaniasis, Leishmania parasites that cause the disease, they are distributed from the Southern USA to Argentina. And we have known about the parasites and studied them for decades, um, even for the last century or more. However, with global change, the disease risk is shifting in geographic extent and, and intensity. So it's appearing in new places or increasing in case numbers um, in areas where only a few cases were previously reported. So, um, Leishmania parasites are transmitted by sandflies, which are like tiny mosquitoes and are maintained in the environment via mammals. So the sandflies involved in transmission are called vectors. Um, they feed on the mammals, which are called reservoir hosts, pick up the infection, then go feed on another mammal and transmit the parasite that way. Um, so there are dozens of known vectors and reservoir hosts. However, in this area of Madre de Dios, the animals at active reservoirs are infection, um, elsewhere, so throughout the rest of Latin America, do not seem to be hosts in this region. Um, and this is an issue that has been really common to the emergence of Leishmania in the Americas. Um, sometimes no known vector or reservoir can be found during a Leishmania, Leishmaniasis outbreak, or the sandflies and mammals that are the usual characters or typical suspects are not found to be infected. Um, so this all points to the likelihood that there are um, unrecognized reservoir hosts and vectors of Leishmania. So the process of systematically sampling and testing for new hosts and vectors in the field is super resource intensive, both from a monetary and time standpoint, and oftentimes really logistically feasible because essentially it come down to sampling the whole mammal and sandfly community in an area. Um, 
However, data science and machine learning can help us to identify potential reservoir hosts and vectors using existing knowledge and uh, data streams. And hopefully this will all help to more quickly identify transmission cycles in areas of Lashmani emergence. Um, so for the rest of my talk, I'll walk through the general concepts behind the, this methodology um, and show our application of the, our methods to Lashmani system. Um, so for a pathogen to be maintained in an environment and spill over to a human host, um, reservoir host and vector distribution must overlap so that there's reservoir host vector contact. Um, and then both the reservoir and vector must um, be susceptible to the infection so that the parasite can um, infect and replicate within the animal. Um, now we have limited data on which mammals and fam samplies are hosts of Leishmania, Leishmania, but we do have more abundant data on traits that are correlated with where the hosts may be distributed and vectors may be distributed in space. Um, which is where animals are exposed via contact and then um, how their immune response responds to infection. Oops. So for instance, thanks to conservation organizations like IUCN um, and iNaturalist and a few other databases like that, we have data on species ranges and occurrence. Um, and this can be overlaid with earth observation data so that we can characterize animals by geography and habitat use. And this should be proxies of where they occur in space um, and where where they might be exposed to the pathogen. Um, next, thanks to decades of natural history research and databases that have compiled this research, as well as textbooks. Um, sorry. Um, we also have data on life history traits, and life history tells us how an animal allocates resources to survival and reproduction which ultimately also dictates the amount of um, resources allocated to immune response and how the animal fights infection. And then um, finally, with increasing molecular data, we're better to, able to um, characterize phylogenetic relationships among animals, so how closely they are genetically related. Um, and this can serve as just a general proxy for the molecular underpinnings of um, species habitat use, behavior, and physiological response to infection, and all these um, Relate with the transmission pathway. Um, so for our study, we use machine learning to combine all of these different streams of data um, and to recognize complex patterns that ultimately helped us to predict host status using animal traits. Um, so ultimately what we did is we um, looked at the traits for known Lashmania hosts. So I'll give a really basic um, oh, summary here before going into actual results. So for instance, we found that Oops, hosts um, lived in warm climates, um, live in areas with high agricultural land use and have high litters. Um, and so using the traits of these known hosts, we can then look at ho um, animals that have not been studied in the context of Leishmania and say like, for instance, these monkeys also live in warm climates, um, have live in areas of high agricultural land use and have large litter sizes. So they're probably Leishmania hosts. So there's a high probability there's they're Leishmania hosts, whereas a steer doesn't share any of the same traits. So there's a low probability that they're Leishmania hosts. Um, so using this method, we calculated the probability of being a Leishmania host for all Latin American mammals, which is about 1500 animals. Um, we use about 50 traits related to host ecology and evolution. And we calculate these trait profiles based on 137 known hosts. Um, on the most basic level, we found that Lashmani hosts primarily live in warm climates and in areas with high human modification, such as where there's a lot of agriculture or urban infrastructure. They have short gestation lengths um, and are phylogenetically similar. So um, although the actual trait profiles are much more complex and contain interactions across a bunch of variables, these are the most heavily weighted traits um, that are modeled based predictions on. So using this trait profile module pr model predicted that there are about 136 unrecognized Leishmania hosts. Um, here on this figure, you see the number of new hosts per genus of Leishmania because the parasites occur across a couple of different um, taxonomic groups. Um, the gray bar represents the number of known hosts in each animal order and the color bar represents the number of newly recognized hosts. So most of the newly recognized hosts were bats or rodents or carnivores. Um, 
Two of the animals that were most likely to be host included the large Vesper mouse and the Marque. Um, the large Vesper mouse has a range that extends in Bolivia, which is an area of really high leishmaniasis incidence, but there's a low number of known hosts. Um, and the Marque, which is this little carnivore right here, has a range that extends from Mexico to Northern Argentina, but it's really elusive and difficult to study, which is perhaps why we don't know if it's a Leishmania host um, based on empirical data collection. Um, Dr. Glidden, are you able to share a few final thoughts? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I'll go through this really quickly. So we um, repeated this analysis for Leishmania vectors and we found about 13 um, sand fly species are likely to be vectors. Um, and so now we can, back, go up, can go back to Madre de Dias and hopefully our analysis has helped to identify animals that can be targeted for future surveillance efforts. Um, so instead of having to sample the entire sand fly mammal community, there's hopefully a few candidate species that can be investigated. Um, and though we identified 136 possible hosts throughout the Americas, a much smaller subset would exist in this region. Um, and I'll just end with saying that this approach has been applied to a lot of different um, zoonotic vector-borne disease systems, showing the power of data science in um, managing and mitigating disease emergence and outbreaks. It, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Glidden. Last but not least is our final panelist, Dr. Desiree Labode. Dr. Labode is a physician scientist, field epidemiologist, global health researcher, and professor for the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Stanford University School of Medicine. She studies the epidemiology and ecology of domestic and international arboviruses and emerging infections with an interest in the vector, host, and environmental factors that affect transmission dynamics and spectrum of disease. The title of her talk today is the interface of vector-borne disease and community empowerment, creating a healthier community through a cleaner environment. Welcome, Dr. Labode. Thank you so much. It's been so fun to be with all of you this morning. Thank you for this incredible opportunity. I've really enjoyed the talks. Um, so let's just get started. So, you know, the theme for today was connecting health and the environment through data. And I think what I do in arbovirology, which is the study of arboviruses, is a great way to connect the environment through vector-borne disease and understand health impacts. So as everyone here knows, human health is inextricably linked to the health of animals, plants, and ecosystems. And with the current climate crisis, things are shifting all the time and the range and life cycle and growing pattern of these diseases and many different organisms are really changing and being impacted by the climate crisis. Oftentimes we use One Health or planetary health approaches to understand and evaluate the impacts on human health. And what I study, again, is the impact of mosquitoes, the world's most deadly animal, right? Mosquitoes, of course, kill almost a million people every single year, and that's because they carry pathogens that kill and maim. And some of those pathogens are mosquito-borne viruses. Um, so I actually just got back from Kenya yesterday, and I always show this picture, of course, I always get bitten up by some mosquitoes. And in Kenya, where I work, in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, when you're bitten by mosquitoes and you end up sick, everyone assumes that it's malaria. But really, what if the fever is not malaria, right? What if the bed net that you're sleeping under thinking that you're protecting yourself from malaria isn't actually the case because you're being bitten by day biting mosquitoes that spread pathogens like dengue and chikungunya, West Nile, or excuse me, yellow fever and Zika. Um, and so we've looked at this, we've used the data I work. It's so great that Aaron Mordecai's um, postdoc just spoke and gave that lovely talk because I have also worked with Aaron and we've looked at the impacts that climate change uh, and really the environment, right, has on these vector-borne diseases. Um, as many of you may know, mosquitoes actually have a temperature optimum at which their biologic processes work perfectly. And the malaria optimum is around 25 degrees. And so as the planet warms, we can imagine that the malaria burden in Sub-Saharan Africa is going to shift, right? Unfortunately, and still include Kenya where I work. What about dengue? Well, dengue 80 is spread by Aedes aegypti, which is again a day biting mosquito that really likes it hot around 29 degrees. And so as the planet warms, there's just going to be more and more of um, risk for this infection. So what really is happening in Africa when it comes to arboviruses? Well, I've been doing this work for about 20 years, and we know that population growth, unplanned urbanization, habitat destruction, much of what we've been talking about in today's panel 
um, and a lot of transborder travel are really contributing to outbreaks and introductions of these mosquito-borne viruses into the continent. And it's been predicted that about 65 million cases of dengue occur in Africa each year. And so what we have been doing over the years is studying um, these infections in human populations, in vectors, and then also using climate data to try to understand disease transmission dynamics. And so we've been working on the Kenyan coast here in Akunda Mosambweni, and then also on the west side, I'm near the shores of Lake Victoria and Kisumu and Chilimbo. And we've been enrolling um, sick children and adults trying to understand what kind of vector-borne diseases are being transmitted. And we've found a lot of malaria, as you would expect, but also a lot of dengue and chikungunya that have gone undiagnosed, a lot of outbreaks, a lot of overlap between malaria and these arboviruses, and a lot of illness due to these infections. In fact, um, we recently um, found that more than 40% of kids with undifferentiated fever actually had dengue in their blood. And we know that all four dengue serotypes actually transmit in Kenya. So this is important because right now there isn't a lot of dengue um, surveillance or detection going on in health centers. There isn't a, a large amount of knowledge known by the clinical care providers. And um, you know we need to prepare ourselves in Sub-Saharan Africa for the ongoing onslaught of these infections, which are important threats to human health. As I mentioned, we also do a lot of vector sampling. And you know, the vectors truly are the tie for me between connecting health and the environment, right? Because the vector is the ectotherm in the environment that actually is transmitting these diseases and incredibly, incredibly climate dependent. And so we trap mosquitoes at all life stages, as you can see there. And we found some very important findings, right? We know that they live about a month where we live and we know when they bite us. We also have seen that the mom mosquitoes can spread the virus to her eggs and the babies can be born already with these viruses, which seems important for, for maintenance in the environment. We've also um, related our, our um, vector abundance and our disease to climate abnormalities and have found that floods have resulted in significantly increased vector abundance and higher risk of infection. And we've also been able to use weather and climate to explain geographic and temporal variation in disease dynamics in Kenya. And we know where these vectors are, we know that they're abundant, and we know they preferentially breed in just a few containers. And so we wanted to intervene, actually. A lot of my talk, the last bit here, is going to be really about the community. Um, we, we wanted to protect people. You know, we discovered this great burden of arboviruses, and now it seems that we should be able to target specific containers, really decrease mosquito abundance and prevent a lot of cases of arboviral disease in our communities. Um, and so there's a great need for community involvement. Um, we know that these mosquitoes are container breeders. We know that people sleep under bed nets because they're worried about malaria. Um, but very few of them actually practice source reduction, which just means cleaning up your backyard, dumping out all the standing water and not providing those habitats for mosquito abundance and mosquito breeding. And so we really wanted to target our community members and our school kids and really teach them about source reduction and take these invisible risks and actually make them visible. And so we designed an intervention study to understand existing barriers and facilitators of household source reduction and developed a school-based intervention strategy and then tested that intervention in school and community-based settings and then reiterated the design and constructed studies in the rural and urban settings. And so we had um, really two parts of our study, a lot of community-based work and then a lot of school-based work. And um, in the schools, you know, we had this very interactive curriculum, a lot of games, a lot of role-playing and so forth, really teaching the kids about um, larval source reduction, the fact that there are different types of mosquitoes that can make them sick. And so on the very first day, we gave kids homework and we said, okay, now that you know what these mosquito vectors look like when they're developing, when they're in their larval forms, kind of wiggly worms in the water, go out into your communities and see if you can find them. And they all came back the next day and said, we found them, we found them. We said, where'd you find them? And they said, in the plastic trash piles behind our homes and schools. And so we knew we had a problem and we actually took these 250 school kids and um, kind of pitted the schools against each other with a little friendly competition. And those 250 kids collected more than 17,000 containers, more than a ton of plastic waste. We repurposed 4,000 of those containers and planted about 4,000 native trees, um, which are now growing really strong and well. Um, but we were still left with about a ton of plastic waste and we had to bury it because there's no formal recycling in Kenya. And so this brings me to the final part of my talk, which is really about the plastic pollution crisis, which again is a way to link community and health and data. Um, so our research has shown that plastic trash, like other solid waste, is really an ideal breeding grounds for these Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Um, and that the plastic is actually the large, you find the largest numbers of mosquito larvae um, there in these yard shops where this plastic is, is um, piling up. 
And this, of course, contributes to a very large burden with more than 50% of our community exposed to these arboviruses. So we started a project called Trash to Treasure, where we we're collecting trash for profit to reduce vector breeding sites. And we worked with these informal plastic trade operators to really improve their business skills and strengthen relationships. And that led to more plastic getting off the street, um, a strong pure network, and significant reductions in breeding. But we knew we had a lot more to do. We needed to create a lot more community awareness, improve the waste infrastructure, create a market to incentivize recycling, do some help with the policy changes that could really support recycling and a sustainability culture, and then cultivate this recycling culture. And so in order to move that work forward, we actually launched a new nonprofit about two years ago now to really focus on inspiring community education and new research and policy change and grassroots activism in these environmental health issues. Um, I hope you follow us. There are all of our links. With this new nonprofit, which I just spent the last two months in Kenya, um, running and working with. We're building education and awareness. We're bringing people together to really center the community in um, environmental initiatives that create local solutions to the plastic pollution and other waste pollution crisis. And we're strengthening relationships, creating a lot of jobs. And then in the end, our ultimate goal is to really decrease mosquito-borne and trash-related health risks and really improve the trajectories of health for our communities and our planet. And the way we're doing this is by creating circular economies of waste in our um, in our setting in South Coast Kenya. So um, in this short talk, I talked about some unmeasured factors in arborology. I talked about solid waste, the built environment, um, governance, which is so important, and then finally structural factors like the inequities and the poverty that actually lead to you know the lack of safe access to clean water, which leads to a lot of unsafe containers laying around, which ends up breeding these mosquitoes and causing people to be sick. Um, I always have to say that arboviruses um, affect um, neglected people and are neglected diseases. They really do affect the impoverished more severely and promote poverty by causing long lasting sequelae. And so we're really trying to partner with communities to really target the problems that matter for those communities, making sure that our work is relevant and has purpose. And through that, like you've heard in a lot of the talks today, we're uncovering a lot of the social and structural determinants of health that create these patterns of disease. Um, so I think all of us um, can, can um, be revolutionaries when we talk about um, using our work to actually push forward what we want to see in the world, the changes that we need to make together. Um, we're talking talking a lot about environment. And so climate is very important. And our work, and especially in arborology, is incredibly climate focused. Um, and it's connected, right? The way that work actually matters and the impacts actually get on the ground to the people who need them is because we're connected and in relationship with those communities. I think all of us here today are systems thinkers, right? Global health, the work I do and the work that everyone who spoke today does really lies at the nexus of very complex systems where you can use data and data science to help um, facilitate a deeper understanding of the mechanisms and the, and the dynamics behind all those systems so that we can tackle and create solutions that actually fix the problems that cause the problems in the first place. And then proximate, right? We're all very close to um, the inequities and in all the facets of our work. So to conclude, arboviral research connects health and the environment through data and uncovers opportunities for activism and advocacy. I think that the global plastic crisis has important health and environmental impacts. We talked a lot about today exposure science. I think the plastic crisis is a major exposure that we need to be focusing on. We're hoping that our nonprofit can tackle this problem through education, awareness building, and active engagement with local communities and policymakers and really catalyze the changes that we need to see on the ground. And then finally, global health practice and research and I think data science provides a foundation of stakeholder relationships that can promote local health issues and really tackle global health inequities. So I want to always thank our study participants. Without them, we would never be learning anything. And I want to thank the many, many people that help bring this work forward um, from Stanford, from the Technical University of Mabasa, the Kenya Medical Research Institute. And I'd like to thank our funding sources and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Labode. Um, I know we've already started the Q&A session kind of asynchronously in the chat, um, but I'd like to invite my tech support to high spotlight all of the panelists at this time so I can ask them a couple more Q&A uh, or questions from the audience. So um, panelists, I'm going to address the question to the group, and if you'd like to answer the question, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, so one of the remaining questions is, the world has changed a lot in the past few years. Global pandemic, extreme weather events, greater consciousness of environmental and social justice issues. 
What are some challenges in your field that you see emerging in the next 10 years? I mean, I can start this. I just was speaking, so I'm warmed up. Um, well, I just mentioned one of them, right? I mean, we focus a lot on the climate crisis. I think the climate crisis is the crisis of our lifetime. Um, and it's many, many impacts. Um, and I, and, you know, and the pollution crisis, I feel like is just part of the climate crisis truly, um, because it is, um, especially with plastic, it is just, um, you know, it's a fossil fuel. It just, it fits with everything that's going on in the climate. Um, I'm an infectious disease physician. And so I worry a lot about the current pandemic of antibacterial resistance, antimicrobial resistance in general. Um, I think that's going to be a huge problem that we're facing. Um, and, um, you know, I worry a lot about, again, I'm a very community focused researcher. And so, you know, in order for humans to really even just survive, right, we need clean air, we need water, we need food, and we need shelter. And I feel like the climate crisis is going to impact all of those things, um, in myriad ways. Right. And so for me, that would be my answer, climate crisis. Uh, yeah, I'd like to chime in on this one. So uh, my research focuses on the uh, environmental exposures and uh, health. So basically, we want to understand how the environmental exposures could change our uh, cells from a healthy state to a disease state. So and the challenges are like from uh, how we're going to quantify those exposures and by how much we can say this exposure A could cause this disease. And if we want to uh, use the uh, exposures as a treatment or prevention method, where should we do it and how much should we do it that we can make an, a, a uh, best outcome out of this? anyone else on the panel like to address that question? Otherwise, I can move on to the next one. OK, I, the next question from the audience is, with recent federal legislation in renewable energy and, oops, uh, and electric vehicles, do panelists anticipate major improvements in air quality and environmental justice impacts? What are some of the sources of air quality pollution and other po environmental pollution that are likely to remain unaddressed? Well, uh, I can certainly uh, address that because uh, the community uh, that I'm working with, uh, we are impacted by uh, mobile sources of pollution. The community is crisscrossed by uh, Highway 101 and uh, 280 uh, and has trucking uh, routes, uh, you know, leading uh, in and out of the industrialized areas, including the uh, system of federal Superfund sites. Uh, but uh, what we have mapped, I didn't have time to show it, is the density of stationary sources of pollution, uh, many of which are not permitted uh, in relationship to the density of sensitive receptors. We have an area in South Central Bayview uh, uh, adjacent to uh, the coast where uh, there are uh, you know, multiple polluting uh, industries uh, immediately adjacent to schools and daycare centers in the neighborhood health uh, uh, center and the uh, high volume McDonald's and nonprofits and, you know, playgrounds and, uh, you know, a swimming pool. Uh, the uh, title of my presentation, uh, View from a, a Playground uh, in Hunters Point, centers upon the fact that the main entry gate to a radiation laboratory complex and a radiation contaminated industrial landfill is across the street from a children's playground and one block south of a basketball court and uh, an infant daycare program and churches and homes and uh, uh, you know public housing and uh, historic mansions. So, um, the uh, shift to 
uh, electric vehicles will help to reduce uh, the emission uh, of so many uh, toxic chemicals, uh, but many of the uh, 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 dangerous chemicals that we're detecting, carcinogenic uh, heavy metals, are a part of uh, the fine particulates that are being, uh, you know, generated by uh, many of these stationary sources. I can add as well, like the CAFOs that I talked about in my presentation are a significant source of point source of pollution, including air pollution, and those are not particularly regulated for their air emissions. It's been the subject of EPA attempted rulemaking and litigation and study for several decades, and there still are not um, very rigorous reporting and permitting requirements around them, so they essentially emit pollutants that or we it's hard to know since they're not regulated um, because if it's not regulated, it's hard to study. So I would say that's an additional um, source. Yeah, and so um, about the electric vehicles, I mean, so that's great that we have electric vehicles and of course transportation and energy, both of those two are huge, huge, um, hugely important for greenhouse gas emissions and for pollution. I mean, again, I just came back from Kenya, you know, there aren't many electric vehicles in Kenya. I mean, when we think globally about these issues, um, you know, the the push for electric vehicles it hasn't hit um, um, many LMICs yet, right? I just spent two months with everyone burning diesel all around me. Um, many, many, many vehicles all burning diesel, um, and um, no electric vehicles. And then, not to mention. Again, to bring up the plastic crisis, 75% of waste in Africa is burned. Um, and so all the plastic pollutants and all of the trash end up as particulates in the air. Um, and so that is another huge problem because until we get the pollution crisis um, really um, under control and in many, many countries, we're probably not gonna see the impacts that we want to see on air quality improvements. Thank you. Did any of the other panelists want to chime in on that? All right. Um, so the next question is, it's amazing to see the variety of applications of data science. What is the number one piece of advice that panelists can give to anyone considering a career in data science? And I would invite all of the panelists to answer this because I'd love to hear your thoughts. I guess I can start. Um, so certainly my journey has not been very straight and I'm still in training 14 years after graduating from college. <laughs> um, and so my one advice would be if data science and quantitative methods really rock your boat, like go for it. But really, um, you know, I think, I think for me, it was just listening to my interest and in following that, kind of following your nose, like I think all of us have that intuition of what really makes us tick, right? And what seems interesting. And for me, I get distracted really easily. Like if I see something new and shiny, I want to go after it and learn more about it. Um, and so, so that's sort of been my guiding theme. It doesn't work for everybody, but um, but the this opportunity I'm really grateful for because I had the chance to really look back on my journey and saw that really data science and quantitative methods of looking at problems from, from an analytical and quantitative perspective was the running theme throughout, you know, my, my undergrad training and my public health training, my medical training, and, and now finishing my molecular pathology, and, and they all are interlinked. And so I think no matter what you choose to really pursue, at the end of the day, they're all going to be related. So, so yeah, that's uh, hopefully that I don't know if that's helpful, but that's my piece of advice. I guess I can go. Um, yes, I think I second that advice. I think when things are not in data science is it's um, great to really think about what really excites you about the application of it and have that kind of guide your career. Um, the other thing that I think or starting out in data science is to, um, I think it's a great idea just to talk to as many people as possible. So if you maybe see a piece of research that someone has done that 
um, really interests you or you know, work at an organization that you're interested, in, I think it really can't hurt to reach out to them and just ask them about their own career opportunity and or uh, their own career path and what advice they have. So I think yeah, I just think it's great to really kind of expand your network early on and um, people like to talk about their work. So yeah, it's great to reach out and ask people about their work. Uh, I would say that we are seeing the convergence of uh, careers of the future uh, that uh, a data science specifically as it's being applied to uh, advanced biomedical uh, technologies uh, allows us to uh, study with increasing accuracy, large populations of people. The most important thing that uh, we're able to achieve uh, with data science uh, is uh, the establishment of direct cause and effect relationships between toxic exposures and expressions of disease. That's one of the basic things that we're, uh, you know, working uh, with uh, in uh, in Hunters Point, uh, and is clearly uh, where uh, all of us uh, as panelists appear to be uh, going. Uh, you know, in the work that we're doing. Thank you. Did anyone else have any career advice you wanted to share? Yeah, I would just say, I mean, I, I believe there's so much power in data science um, to really, um, you know, make a difference to really advance science in general, to advance what we know, to advance what the risks are, what the causes are, as was, was just said, you know, what potential solutions we might be able to find to to um, protect our health. And I, I, um, I just I would say to anyone who's who's interested in data science, data science can be anything, you know, when you when you're learning um, the methods, right, I think it's also a career that you can really study many, many things, right? You're not necessarily pigeonhole, pigeonholed with, you know, a certain sort of, let's say, laboratory method that you need to apply in a certain way to a certain system, right? You can you can use methods to and and apply them to a lot of different um, important fields in science and in health, you know. And so I think again, I think there's just great power. And if it's something that's interest that interests you, you should definitely, as was just said, like speak with everyone um, and, and try it out and, and um, see if it really is something that, that excites you and makes you want to learn more and, and work hard. Thank you so much. Um, so at this point, I would just like to extend my gratitude to the amazing panelists for the Connecting Health and the Environment Through Data session. Um, you all graciously shared your time and expertise with us and you presented really inspiring and fascinating talks and were so generous answering the attendee questions. So thank you so much. Um, and at this point, we're going to have a five minute break before we return to our closing keynote session with Karen Mathis. And we will return with her talk at 1140. So we'll be back in about five minutes. Thank you so much.
Hello, we are returning from our short break at this time to listen to the closing keynote address. I have the honor of introducing Karen Mathis. Karen is Executive Director of Biomedical Informatics in the Department of Biomedical Data Science, DBDS, at Stanford, where she manages the graduate degree program and leads department strategic initiatives. Karen has taught courses at Stanford, such as Critical and Analytical Thinking and AI for Good, and also co-founded and served as co-director of the Women in Data Science, or WIDS, Global Initiative, which now reaches over 100,000 participants each year. Karen has extensive experience in business and held management roles at Apple Computer and at Cellular One, an AT&T company. Karen holds an MBA from Stanford University and a BS in systems engineering with highest distinction from the University of Virginia. The title of her closing address today is The Pipeline for Women in Data Science, Key Strategies with Social and Environmental Impact. Karen welcomes questions and would like to close her keynote with a brief Q&A, so please do share your questions in the Q&A box while she's speaking. Welcome, Karen. Great, thank you. And let me pull up my slides here. Let's see, one second. Hopefully you can see that. Let me get on slideshow here. Yes, we can see it. Great. And uh, thanks to all the organizers of this event. It's just been a fabulous uh, event so far. I am incredibly inspired by what I heard about the intersection of environment and healthcare. So much going on in this space. And um, I'm excited to share with you uh, something quite related, and that is regarding the pipeline and building a larger pipeline of women into data science through these areas with social environmental impact. Um, so before I launch into all of that, um, I thought I'd share just a few words about myself and my journey and maybe a few uh, bits of advice. So uh, as Sam mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Biomedical Informatics Program. It's in the Department for Biomedical Data Science. And that's me and some colleagues around a tree. Um, we uh, have a lot of fun in the department. And this was an event last year. Um, our department is very interdisciplinary. And some of the research is definitely in this space. Um, for instance, Dr. Julia Salzman is faculty in our department. And we have a PhD and a master's program. So if any of you are interested in that sort of work, uh, please feel free to reach out to me afterwards and I'll leave my contact info at the end. Um, so how did I get there? Um, well, it definitely um, didn't start out with an interest in anything related to data science. In fact, as a, a kid, I was mainly interested in music. So that's a picture of me playing piano, uh, love music and dance and that sort of thing. And when I got to college, I was um, really undecided and just went into the uh, liberal arts uh, as a general major um, and pretty much floundered my first year. So I really wish that I had had um, events like this one to hear about pathways, to see role models, and um, I think that's a common theme that's been a challenge for me is just trying to find good role models. And I would say for all of you um, listening that um, definitely seek out those role models um, of any gender, really, and also take time to mentor others. So important for um, uh, younger women and girls in this space to see um, those role models they can relate to. Well, um, I was lucky. I did find a few women um, who were students in the School of Engineering, and they convinced me to join the engineering school in systems engineering, um, which one of the uh, speakers previously talked about these big system-wide challenges. That's what attracted me to engineering. And um, it was really exciting to work in that field for a few years. Um, and then fast forward, I did go back to um, get an MBA at Stanford and ended up working um, at Apple Computer for what seemed like a lifetime, um, running around the world, launching Macintosh and other products for Apple. Um, some of you may recognize the guy in the golf cart. That's a co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak, who I had the pleasure of working with to um, launch some of the Macintosh a while ago. 
And um, I guess my message here is I uh, definitely had a nonlinear path through data science in my career and also um, definitely took a few risks along the way. For instance, working in different countries, um, trying out many different roles. And I definitely encourage you all to take those risks and try new things along the way because that can really help um, broaden your career and lead to some exciting new um, pathways. Um, then about eight years ago, when I was at Stanford teaching, um, I met Professor Margot Gerritsen, uh, joined the School of Engineering, and we co-founded the Women in Data Science. Um, and uh, it's hard to believe that was in 2015. And so exciting to see where it is today with a worldwide initiative. So I know all of you are familiar with WIDS. Um, I just wanted to share share with you the latest in our thinking of why WIDS is even more important today than it was eight years ago when we founded this. And I think the sense of urgency stems from data science um, really reshaping our world today in so many different ways um, with AI, uh, generative AI, other technologies really coming in at um, such a rapidly increasing rate. Um, and yet at the same time, we see women still so underrepresented. And really it's important to have women and much more diversity having a seat at the table so that we create solutions that work for all of us and that mitigate biases. It's also important for wealth creation for women and also to address this really um, need and a dearth of data scientists around the world. Um, so it's definitely a great opportunity for more women to get involved at this point. So our vision and our mission all center around what we call 30 by 30. That's our guiding star. And the idea is that we would have 30% or more women at all levels in all areas of data science across academia, industry and government, NGOs by the year 2030. So that's our 30 by 30 mission. So our inaugural research was a great team effort. And I should say we were grateful for the support from Pivotal Ventures to do this research. That's Melinda Gates's organization. And we had a team effort to address these three areas around the pipeline of women into graduate programs. One, we looked at our baseline. What's the current representation of women in these programs today? Second, we looked at the barriers to pursuing graduate degrees. And finally, we came up with a framework and a comprehensive programming to address these barriers. So you may be wondering, why do we focus on graduate programs? Um, certainly there is a lot of need out there in other areas as well, but we really had two key reasons. One is we looked at data such as this from LinkedIn, showing that today, over 80% of data scientists in the US, at least those who post on LinkedIn, have a graduate degree. So at least a master's degree. Um, and that was um, those who listed themselves as data scientists or senior data scientists or anything related um, had this graduate level. We also had done focus groups as part of our research, talking to industry professionals. Um, senior leaders in industry who said when they're hiring for data science roles that the minimum bar is a graduate degree, a master's degree. So we decided to focus on graduate programs in this initial research. And we did quite a bit of research, both quantitative and qualitative. So we started by looking at data from the US Department of Education to get a baseline. We looked at what's called IPEDS. And that collects data from about 99% of universities and colleges in the US on who are in these graduate programs today. Um, we did a literature search and we identified key barriers um, and interventions. And then we did extensive interviews with um, people at universities across the US. And it was interesting because we didn't wanna just focus on schools like Stanford, so we looked at private and public universities, small and large. We looked at minority-facing institutions. 
And we also looked at um, uh, diversity in terms of geographic diversity. So we tried to get schools from around the country and not, for instance, just on the coast. Um, we did focus groups, as I mentioned. We surveyed our own WIDS community. And we also looked at what programs are there today out there to address these barriers, because we didn't want to just reinvent the wheel. So the first key findings from this research is that today in the traditional, what we would call uh, traditional pipeline programs, like in computer science and in traditional electrical, um, electronics engineering, also mechanical engineering, I didn't show it, but it was similar, um, that we had a low percentage of women in these graduate programs today. So the bars, the height of the bar is a percentage of women. Um, as you can see in CS and double E, it's below 30%. In the mathematics area, it's slightly higher, but still 30% or below for PhDs and a little higher in statistics. So we wanted to see where do we stand today? And the lighter blue bar is international women in these programs in US colleges. And the darker blue bar is US citizens and permanent residents. So um, we looked at that, we said, we still have this challenge that's been around for quite a few years now. And then we started to um, analyze the data and we really came up with um, these ahas around six key areas. So I suggest, I can't cover them in depth today, but please read the research and there's a lot more information. The first aha was around um, low awareness. So many of the women that we spoke with just did not understand what the pathways were um, and what they could do with a data science master's or PhD related degree. They weren't aware of how they could um, have some societal impact and they didn't realize the value. What was the value proposition of going on and spending more time and perhaps funding to get that graduate degree? A lot of the research focused on challenges around self-efficacy, that um, feeling that you can really per persevere and be successful. So self-confidence came up a lot, um, self-identity uh, and imposter syndrome. I think one of the speakers this morning talked about that already, um, but that imposter syndrome issue definitely loomed large in the research. Uh, we saw a lack of uh, effective faculty mentorship, um, we saw skill development as a core um, barrier. And then on the family and peer and community support, that was really interesting. Um, we heard that quite a number of times, that that was a significant barrier. Or actually, conversely, on the flip side, for those who did have that support from family and those around them and the community, how important that was for them being successful in graduate programs. So having WIDs or other types of programs that provide that community and structure and support, we saw was incredibly important. And finally, the issues around perpetuation of biases and stereotypes around gender, that was definitely a strong barrier. So based on all of the research, we developed what we called WIDs Academy. And this is a cross-university initiative. Um, we looked at comprehensive programming um, developed in WIDS, but really to support students in all universities and colleges, um, focus broadly um, at undergraduates from their very first uh, year in undergraduate programs, but also could help for students in master's and PhD programs in different areas who might wanna get, for instance, uh, a second master's or get a master's while they're getting a PhD, which we see is more and more common to get that second master's in data science areas. So we wanted to target a very broad audience. And then uh, we only had a finite amount of time to focus on our research. So we decided to forge um, and look at forging a direct path um, from students going directly from undergraduate to graduate school. Uh, definitely, we saw a need for other programs to look at women who are out there in the workforce who want to come back and get the graduate degree. So that's absolutely incredibly important as well. We just didn't have the time to focus on that. So we narrowed in on this direct path. We also looked 
uh, carefully uh, uh, focus on master's degrees. Um, certainly getting a PhD, as you saw in the slide before, is really important to boost the numbers of women PhDs in these programs. But we saw, given the, um, the goals and the challenges really um, in the next few years, that the master's degree was the uh, low-hanging fruit. The fastest way to boost the numbers of women in data science who were on a trajectory to go to the most senior levels and also that um, it uh, address barriers around um, costs of getting a degree and the opportunity costs and time involved. So um, some people ask me, since I'm in the School of Medicine, is it possible to get a master's in the School of Medicine and be successful uh, versus a PhD or an MD? And I would say for data science and biomedical data science or informatics, absolutely yes. We have actually three types of master's programs with alumni who come out and are very successful. So I'd say a master's degree can be an absolutely great career path. And finally, we wanted to offer a flexible design so that universities could pick some pieces. They don't have to pick all of our programming and slot it into what they already have. So those were our core strategies. And when we talk about that broad opportunity, one of the first things we looked at is moving beyond this traditional pool of CS and math and statistics and engineering and reaching out to many, many more undergraduates, those in um, biology and physical sciences um, and conservation and natural sciences, certainly in undergraduate in economics. Um, and a lot of people there now are environmental economics, which is great. Uh, business and so forth, we wanted to reach them with these awareness messages. And I think that's a great opportunity for them to go on for a graduate degree in data science. And we looked at these three areas, uh, first building awareness, then consideration, and then skill building and preparedness. So for instance, in awareness, our goal is to expose students to relatable models uh, through WIDs and many other ways, and really a boost awareness of how data science and AI can address um, medical challenges, other societal challenges, environmental issues. That's really core to everything we're doing. Um, we want to articulate the value of grad studies and then provide those opportunities like REU, which is our research experiences for undergraduates really key for those undergraduates to get some experience, seeing what a lab is like, working with some faculty, maybe some uh, graduate students and postdocs. I think those things can be incredibly inspirational for the undergraduates. And now I wanna dive deeply into boosting awareness for um, societal environmental challenges, because I think that's especially important given the topics today. So we, as I mentioned, we talked to many, many people as part of our research. And one of my role models is Maria Clave, president of Harvey Mudd. She spoke at WIDS a few years ago, and she's done just a tremendous job at Harvey Mudd, increasing the percentage of women in the computer science um, undergraduate studies. So one of the key things that they've emphasized is on in their coursework is on ways that computer science can benefit society. And that's been a really successful theme for them. We also, in our research, we looked at research from the Clayman Institute at Stanford. Big shout out to them for some extraordinarily great work. Um, there's one piece of research on a cultural framework around interdependence and independence. And what they found was that um, for women, they're much more encouraged towards this theme of interdependence where social impact is much more important in their self-identity. We also saw in our iPads analysis, this is the same chart as before, but I've added uh, newer areas of engineering, biomedical and bioengineering, environmental engineering. We've seen that women are attracted to these areas of engineering. Well, they're not as attracted to the traditional areas of double E or computer engineering or mechanical engineering. 
So all of that leads us to believe that um, emphasizing that societal and environmental impact is really important in everything we do. So in WIDS Academy, we have these eight key elements, and I won't go through all of them today, but those are um, pieces that we're building programming around that different schools and universities can adopt and uh, incorporate it into their courses and their um, seminars and workshops. Um, already at Stanford, we're doing a lot of work, for instance, around the WIDS Datathon. We had a class for the first time around the WIDS Datathon this year, which was really exciting. And let me share a little bit more. I'll hone in on the WIDS Datathon because that's a, a part of WIDS that um, I helped start a number of years ago that really fits with this theme of the intersection of healthcare and environment. So we started the Datathon to encourage more women to do these kinds of skill building activities. Um, traditionally on the Kaggle Datathon platform, um, they saw that 90% or 80 or 90% of their participants were men. And we really wanted to flip that and have that percentage of women. So one thing we did is we focused our Datathon every year on a societal impact challenge. And we said, Every team needs to be at least 50% uh, women, those identifying as women. So we want to encourage women to hone their skills um, and build their self-confidence as well as make connections in the community. So we had in 2019, a datathon on uh, identifying oil palm plantations, which is a really important deforestation issue. And then in 2020, we moved to the GOSIS data set, which is all about intensive care units. And we predicted uh, survival rates. And we stayed with the GOSIS data set in 2021 to look uh, about diabetes conditions for ICU patients. Then in 2022, we started working with a terrific group, Climate Change AI and some data sets that they provided um, to predict energy consumption of buildings in a particular area. And we stayed working with climate change this year, uh, climate change AI, and looked at um, weather temperature and precipitation predictions. So always our datathon has those themes. Um, we have a datathon coming up next year that will uh, continue in these areas and it will be extended um, to six months long in 2024. So we'll have more announcements about that datathon coming soon. And I'm excited to share that this datathon um, this year had over 4,000 registrants. It really blew us away um, about where they came from. It was truly worldwide with 100 country participants. And one of the most exciting things that we heard in the surveys afterwards is that 73% said they learned new skills and they also boosted their self-confidence in getting involved here. So if you haven't been involved, I really encourage you to get involved with the Datathon and bring it to your own schools and universities. I also mentioned we looked at um, areas um, uh, and other programs that are addressing these important barriers. And we found that WIDS Academy really hit a sweet spot. So yes, there are a number of excellent programs out there today. Many of them focus on undergraduates going straight into industry afterwards. There really aren't any focus on women going from undergraduate and encouraging them to go on for that graduate degree. So we felt this is really a sweet spot that we're addressing with the WIDS Academy. So I'd say in summary, um, we see some significant barriers, uh, persistent low percentages of women in a number of pipeline degree programs. And the good news is that with the interdisciplinary nature of data science and AI, there's a huge opportunity there to really broaden that pipeline. So we want to have comprehensive programming through WIDS Academy, uh, focus on social environmental impact, and really involve all of you. So please uh, check out the research paper. Here's the QR code. We welcome your thoughts. Um, we'd love to have you all involved, um, helping us all to reach that 30 by 30 goal uh, by 2030. And here are some uh, 
information on who you can reach out to. Uh, certainly, Margot Gerritsen um, for anything related to WIDS worldwide is tremendous to reach out to her. And at Stanford, Elizabeth Wilsey's great point of contact. I'm also happy to um, chat further afterwards. And I think I'll stop there and just acknowledge all the people involved in this research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience, if you have a moment to answer them. Um, we have a question from Ali. Ali asks, a uh, question about the focus on master's degrees. It seems like a sound strategy, but it is much harder to get funding for a master's than a PhD. So has the additional debt load been a consideration in having these discussions? Absolutely. And thank you for bringing up because I didn't mention one key thing. And that is that another reason why we focus on the masters is because we see uh, increasingly that many schools, at least across the U.S., offer an acceler accelerated master's degree, which really um, lowers the um, barrier to the cost to going through the master's program. So it has many different names, accelerated masters, four plus one. At Stanford, it's called co-terminal. Um, but the idea is that while you're studying in your undergraduate years, you start to take some master's classes. And with one additional year, you come out with that additional degree. And so we see that as a great way with um, um, a lower cost or barrier to getting through um, and only one year as opposed to a traditional master's, which may take two or even more years. Um, certainly in a PhD program, at least at, um, in our program and many others, um, that is covered, or at least the main portion. We have four years of covered funding. So that's one awareness piece that um, we found that a lot of undergraduates don't know about, that PhDs, their funding can be covered. Um, however, we did see the barrier about the opportunity cost. And we saw another key point was we saw the because the family was so important in that support network and that uh, encouraging women to go on, that when we create the value proposition, that we have to give a value proposition, not just to the woman interested in the graduate program, but something that resonates with their entire family. Uh, sometimes they're the breadwinner for their family. And so we found there was a barrier sometimes in um, that four-year or five-year PhD program being out of the workforce for that many years, but just the one year with an accelerated master's could be acceptable. So thanks for asking that question. That's a really good one. Yeah, thanks for your thoughtful response. Um, so perhaps we have time for one more question from the audience. Um, the next one is, what aspect of your findings give you hope? And what aspects concern you? For the concerns, what kind of remedies would you recommend? That is a great question. Well, what gives me hope is um, the uh, those bars that I showed you about uh, young women, for instance, going into these newer areas of engineering, where they can see very clearly the impact on um, biomedical areas and on environmental areas. And that gives me a lot of hope that if we can um, articulate those pathways and the um, impact that women in data science can have in the world, that we'll see many, many more young women going into these fields. And we definitely have to start even earlier than undergraduate days. Uh, a lot of the work in WIDS is focused on middle and high schoolers, so secondary school students, to show those pathways as well. Um, what's frustrating to me is still that um, in the CS areas that we still see those very low bars. And I think what gives me hope is that um, with programs like this, um, with these WIDS Academy elements, that hopefully we'll see more universities adopting these elements, rolling them into their um, CS, but in many other undergraduate programs, so that um, a lot more undergraduates can see, aha, this is something that I can relate to, that I can be a part of and, and decide to go into data science. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation, thought-provoking keynote, and then those thoughtful responses to the audience questions. I really appreciate your time, Karen. Um, right now, we're coming to the end of our program. So I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the panelists and all the speakers for their time and effort today. 
Personally, I feel very inspired after hearing all the career journeys and research efforts of all the women who spoke during our conference today, especially in relation to our theme, connecting health and the environment through data. Um, we really do appreciate all of you for sharing your expertise and making this event a real success. And I would like to thank the team at Lane Medical Library, without whom this event definitely could not be possible. And they include Colleen Cuddy, Sonam Sony, Connie Wong, Katie Stinson, Amanda Woodward, and the rest of the Lane Medical Library staff. I'd like to thank the captioners for their assistance today. And before we end the webinar, I wanted to remind all the attendees that we will be sending you a follow-up email with a link to the recording and an evaluation form that we're going to use to plan our 2024 event. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your time and say goodbye.